State of Grey. Hello and welcome to Triangle Square, the PlayStation podcast. I'm your host, Brett, back and alongside me, as always, is one Mr. Chris Figs. Chris, how are you doing today? Uh, after a, a hellish day of work, are you back home and feeling better? I'm definitely back home. Um, <laughs> so there's that. But yeah, it's it's been a it's been a hell of a day. It's been a hell of a day. A lot of revelations um, mm. that happened today. So, well, if there's something I learned today, Chris. Hell is us. It's true. Yeah, that is so, true. So you have that going for you. Uh, well, Chris. Today, we are going to, of course, talk about the state of play that just came and went today. We're going to talk a little bit about Silent Hill 2 and how long you should expect it to be exclusive to PlayStation. Uh, Some old IPs from the Vita's past making a surprise resurgence and what that might mean for other niche, you know, not very fostered IP that Sony have in their graveyard. Um, Concord not being the end of Sony's... uh, or rather Concord not being indicative of Sony's ability to succeed in the games as a service market uh, and a few other things. But before we get there, we're going to start this show off in a time honored way of checking in on what we've been playing. If you're new to the show, we hope you stick around and enjoy what we're talking about. But this is where we kind of give each other a chance to either put each other onto new games uh, or just talk about games that are big and happening at the moment when we happen to be playing those. So often we find ourselves playing old games. It's just yeah. the nature of how it goes. And interestingly enough, we've heard a lot of people say that they like that we're a podcast that talks about games that aren't necessarily the here and now so that they, you know, sometimes we're talking about things that they're more interested in playing at the moment, which is uh, interesting to say. So, Chris. So, Brett, what have you been playing? And then we can get into story time um, huh. for Triangle, Triangle Square on my part. <laughs> yeah, I have mine, too. My, I thought my PS5 was dead for all three days. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's start with story time for Chris, because oh, we do yes. have a shared game that led to this <clears throat> scare. <laughs> yes. So we, two of us have been playing uh, 40K Space Marine, which I've been very excited for. And um, so, yeah, every time I was playing 40, I was playing Space Marine, uh, my PS5 just hard crashed. And I'm talking like CRT level on my screen kind of shit. You know, when it all yeah. kind of fades down, that's what it looked like. It would just end. And it must have sucked was like for 30 to 45 minutes yeah. of play mm-hmm. and guarantee you'd be down. Yeah. Yeah. And it was one of those things where like every once in a while, it, it was one of those things that sucked because like, I would get comfortable with it not crashing and then it would immediately crash. I'd be like, okay, we're good. We're going to get to the end of the level. And then I was like, oh shit, it's, I'm just done. So, um, yeah, so I wasn't sure what the issue was and I had thought it was just Space Marine. I was like, oh, it's super powerful. It's killing my well, PS5. <laughs> I can understand how you got there as well and it seems like other people are saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. Though what other people also might be experiencing is that they've not thoroughly cleaned their PlayStations and this game is also taxing their PS5 and that combination of things yeah. is what's popping you. But before we gloss over it, I just want to say how crazy it was to go through that because when Chris and I started playing Space Marine, Chris is hosting uh, and so I didn't know until the second time we were playing and I just thought, oh, Space Marine's a really challenging game. And then it turns out we've been playing it on Veteran, so there's that, which is not a problem. The game is quite fun. I'm, that's not an issue. But it makes more sense as to why it's taking us longer to get through levels. Mm-hmm. And then couple that with the fact that every time we start making progress, <laughs> your PlayStation crashes, <laughs> takes a few minutes to even turn back on, and then we have to get back in the game, get back in the party, start yeah. up again, play for a while, have some issues because we're on veteran and then the whole process starts over <laughs> again. Uh, so we played for like two and a half hours and did one mission, yep. <laughs> which I don't think is even remotely the normal mission time. So no. I thought that was quite funny. And it was, it got, it was funny because by the end of that session, we were, I was looking at the collectibles thing. Um, and I'm like, well, we picked up the last collectible, so I think we have just enough time before it crashes that we can finish this level and get credit for it. <laughs> uh, oh, so that man. did work. But yeah, the whole saga was basically... So I I took it apart. Not fully took it apart. I took the the, the flaps off or whatever. I stripped my the, PS5 the plates. down. The plates. 
the plates. <laughs> the flaps. That's, that's the better word. The, the mm, plates. Those are good looking flaps, boy. <laughs> Roast beef. <laughs> Let um, me get up in them flaps, PlayStation. Oh. <laughs> the f- flap bussy. <laughs> <laughs> um Sabathosi. Yeah, so I so there goes I our take, Destiny 2 talk. <laughs> yeah, enjoy Velvet. Um I took the plates off and I like air um used compressed air, pulled it all out. Um and I'm like, okay, this should work. And then it didn't. So I was just like, my PS5, my PS5 is just dead. Fried, done. So well, didn't you also say that it was starting to crash in games that weren't Space Marine? Yeah, and that's so, what led you to believe, like, oh, no, my, my whole yeah. PS5 is just fucked. Yeah, because, so, okay, so this has happened over two sessions with Space Marine. That's the detail we're missing. This was twice. True. Uh, True. So the first time it was just Space Marine, and then on my own time I've been playing, like, games we'll talk about, like Persona, Bellatro, like all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And it had been running fine. And then after the second session where we it crashed, like, three or four times, then... Persona started crashing my PS5. And I was like, this is just done. Like, this is just over. And then just out of happenstance, I had been playing Baldur's Gate 3 the night before, and I had texted Sean, and I'm like, hey, do you want to play a new run of Baldur's Gate? Because I just want to get all my trophies and stuff and get that platinum. Um, And he responded to my text, and and then I told him, well, it's not going to happen because I'm trading in my PS5 because it's dead. And he goes, no, that that was exactly what was happening to me. This is all you have to do. So I broke the PS5 completely down. I broke my warranty seal. Like I opened it all the way up. I cleaned out all the vents and it has not crashed since. It's dead silent again, which is insane. Um, so I think we've survived. I will say, in a weird twist... I was a little disappointed that I fixed it because I was kind of down to play my PS3 for two months. <laughs> you could have just lied to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I could have. I could have. Um, Traded it in and got your value so that you could yeah. get that, that PS5 Pro for $1,000. Sweet, sweet PS5 Pro. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> the PS5 is working again, which is great. Yeah. Um, Which is great because I was kind of like, shit, I'm going to have to put – actually, it's funny. A lot of the decisions that I made yeah. in, a, in for my story time were all based on the fact that I thought you didn't have a PS5 anymore <laughs> <laughs> because you straight up messaged me going to trade it in today. And it was yeah. like – that was like the beginning of the day. And I didn't yeah. know until the very end of the day that, yeah. oh, never mind. I got it working. Well, once once he told me – I was like, I might as well just try this. Um, And then I'm like, oh, it's going, you know, because the pro has always been, I think think I've talked about on this podcast, like I'll probably get one, but like all my extra shit is going towards it. Like my portal and my, maybe my PSVR two, but the PS5 and uh, my switch. So yeah, this was the opportunity where I'm like, well, at the very least I'll be able to pre-order it. Um, But yeah, so now I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, that's my story time. It was a very interesting and a little demoralizing. The worst part, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep adding to my story time, but the worst part, and this is a shining a, a shining endorsement of the game, so I was finally playing through Persona 3, and it, cra- I would lose, and this is my fault, I'm a fucking idiot, but I would lost two hours of progress like four times. and this Because you me, weren't saving? Because I wasn't saving, but it was also hard crashing. Because that was one of those things. You get into like a rhythm state where I'm like, I'm going up Tartarus, um, and I'll when I'm done, I'll save, and then I just never finished. So that was actually how I knew the PS5 was fixed. Is I got past everything I'd been doing and finished Tartarus. I'm like, okay, well, this is about when it should crash, and it's not. So I think we're okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was that was pretty shitty to lose all that progress. That was a nice thing about Space Marine. I don't know if it was because of you guys or just the game in general, but I didn't lose any progress in Space Marine. It's kind of popped back into where I was, so it's yeah. pretty nice. Yeah, that's a good setup. All right, so what else have you been playing? Yeah, I've, um, I've heard some Persona 3 Reload in there. Yeah, I am I knew playing you've had that. some Bellatro. You've surprised mm-hmm. me with a few other things this week, so oh, let, yeah? let's hear it. Oh. See, now I, this is the one week we didn't write anything down, and now I'm forgetting. But the big thing that I have been playing is um, Persona 3 Reload. Um, I'm really enjoying that. 
I don't know if I'm going to finish it, though. Really? Well, you know, this is a good time to hop in. Uh, I hung out with Donovan, and we were talking. Mm-hmm. He actually hit me up before that and was like, hey, I feel like you slightly misconstrued my my Persona point. And basically, he was saying he still thinks that it's probably ideal to play Persona 5 first. Yeah. He thinks that it's probably the way to go. Um, so it, it, it ended up working out in the long run, but no, I thought that was interesting. I was, was one of those things. I, yeah, I was joking. So, I, I knew. That's the thing that I'll say. It's... I'm not. It's not that I'm not going to finish this because I don't want to. It's that I would rather play Metaphor, and I don't have enough time to finish Persona Three and care. You know, like sure. I could finish yeah. Persona Three, but I'm not going to know what happened by the end. Um, so yeah, I'll probably go play Metaphor, and then we'll see. Um, I don't know. The thing with Persona Three is that I will say. I think there are some things presentation wise that I prefer in Persona 3 Reload than Persona 5. Mm-hmm. But what I will say is that the entire time I've been playing Persona 3, I would rather be playing Persona 5. Yeah, that's interesting. Like I downloaded Persona 5 because I'm like, fuck it, I would rather play this. But I do want to see Persona 3. Like I like the game. Persona 5 is just so much better. So much better. <laughs> that It's kind of crazy to me. Um, but uh, Bellatro has been a big one. Um, I've been playing a lot of that. It's fun. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about Bellatro. I'm trying to beat the Purple Steak. And Ooh. it's <laughs> fucking brutal, bro. <laughs> Like, I've had runs where, like, any other steak, I would have smoked it. And I hit, like, anti-7, and it's over. Yeah. It is uh, it's a, it, over. It's brutal. Have yeah. you? What steak are you on? Are you on any of the high ones? That's, with that's or purple. Oh, you're on purple? I don't yep. know how to... I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I can't beat it with... Yeah. And that's the thing. And the deck that I'm actually on it is... Give me a second. I think it's... it's Is it red that gives you the extra starting money? Yeah. No, yeah, that's the one. No, I think that's blue? blue. I think that's gold. Because there's a gold deck and the money's gold. You so might be that, well, whatever deck it is is the one that gives you extra starting money because I like yeah. to get a chance to buy a Joker in the first shop if possible. Mm-hmm. That tends to be the way that I've enjoyed playing. So I've I've beaten it with multiple decks, but I've really liked that deck. So I that's the one I tend to have the highest stake on. Uh, and I cannot get it. And it's like no matter what I do. So I'm really thinking that's a stake I'll have to approach with a different deck. But also it's like you kind of want to – why why can't I try and beat this stake with this deck? Yeah, um, but you can't do that. <laughs> oh, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'd have oh, to go okay. literally keep playing different yeah. stakes at different decks to get to that point. That's what I'm saying. The uh, Whatever deck that it is I'm talking about, I, I'm really not sure which one it is, but um, whichever one it is, it's been a while since I've played. That's the only one I've gotten a purple on. And so it's just been like, oh, I'm going to keep trying to go with this one because mm-hmm. I, I was like, I'm taking a break on trying to unlock new decks. Because for a while, I started going beat, you know, red stake on every deck. And you'll yeah. be fine, and that way you can unlock every deck and see what works. And I, I didn't, I never got that far. I have a lot of the decks, but I never got that far. <laughs> I think I'm only so. missing one. I did unlock this deck that I'm really interested in, but I don't know how. I don't understand the mechanic. Have you unlocked the plasma deck? I don't think so. So the plasma deck balances the multiplier and the chips, and I don't understand the math well enough to beat the deck. So when I say that, that means if I if I get 200 chips and a four multiplier, it will split the chips into the multiplier and into the into the chips. So the chips oh, will go they down. Average the them multi- together. So that's what I don't. But but I don't understand how it works because it's like 40 so it, and 40 when you hit yeah. 200 coin. I don't. So it understand says your it. total chips and your total mult are averaged together before they get multiplied. So this is, uh, and it says, like, for example, uh, 70 and 4. So it'd be Mm -hmm. 70 plus 4, and then 74 divided by 2, and then 37 times 37. Oh, I hate that way. I hate that more than what I thought it was doing. Yeah, so what it's doing is averaging it out and then multiplying the average by its average. So by itself. Yeah, I don't like that. I hate that. 
Because yeah, what I thought it was doing was if I had a 15 multiplier and a 200 and 200 chips, I thought it was taking the 200 chips and evening them out. Mm-hmm. And clearly that's not what it is. And no. I don't, I don't like the way that sounds, but yeah, it is cool. It says, Cause in like my first hand, I got like 40,000 chips. Yeah. But I couldn't figure out how the hell it worked. So yeah. it wasn't productive. There you have it. It's always chips plus multiplier divided by two and then squared. Okay. Interesting. But yeah. <laughs> it, um, so yeah, Bellatro is great. I, it's one of those games that like I want to one day platinum. And it dude, doesn't, I, I really it, thought about it, but it's, it's a brutal dude, platinum. Completionist plus, I didn't know what that was really until I went and looked at the trophy guide. You have to beat gold steak with every, every joker. Yeah. That doesn't make any fucking sense. Could you imagine trying to do a gold steak with the plus four multiplier joker? Dude, I, I'm telling you, that's insane. That, that's why I looked at it, and I'm like, I haven't even bothered looking, but I know the last time I looked, nobody had the platinum, but there's it was pretty early on. I'm yeah. read, I was reading about people going for it, and there's like full strategies. And the it's, just, it's really the fact that you can't seed. If you could seed it, it would be an easy platinum. Sure. Yeah. Like it's still entirely on how good you are, but easy. But yeah. so you can't. You seed, can find so an ideal seed that can give you the things that you need to play it off. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's complicated because you know it's funny. I was talking uh, yesterday with Donovan about because um, I was telling him he should try out Bellatro, and we were talking about inscription and how he fell off of inscription in the final area. Mm-hmm. And I was telling him that uh, I at one point, whenever I was playing inscription, I was so into it that I was like, I want to go for platinum. And then I started looking at the trophies after I beat the game, and I was like, Oh, this is. This is awful. <laughs> I don't think yeah. I can do this. It's like it's going to sap all the fun from the game. And I was like, but what's funny is that when I when I got really into the Bellatro and, and beat a few stakes and then decided to look at the trophies, I was like, oh, Jesus. Like, <laughs> there's this recontextualizes the inscription because now inscription seems easy. A pain in the ass, but doable. <laughs> yeah. I. I would, yeah, I'd love to go for Bellatro, but it's never going to happen. Which is, I think, a ringing endorsement for Bellatro, where I'm like, I'm just going to play this because it's fucking fun. Oh you yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, like it's one which of is why like, I kind of like Inscription because I, it, since I don't have the platinum, if I tell people to play it and then I beat it, it's like you know it, it had nothing to do with the platinum. Yeah, which right. I think that depends, right? If you know me and you've listened to this show for a while, you tend to know that I platinum a game after I beat it. Like I don't mm-hmm. go into a game thinking I'm going to platinum it. I play it. If I enjoyed it enough to beat it, usually I'll beat it. And then I'll be like, did I enjoy it enough to where I'd want to keep playing its platinum? And then sometimes it can be a quick glance at the trophy list and be like, I still would enjoy this game enough to play four more hours to platinum it or whatever the hell it is. Right. But it does become a thing where it's like, well, I enjoyed this game. But if platinuming it just for one trophy is going to take three more playthroughs, I don't like it that much. So I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, we're like so, in that way. Which is funny because I feel like I'm the opposite where people are, wouldn't if, – if I said that, they would be like, oh, shit, it's, he just doesn't care about the trophies. Where it's funny because I feel like you actually care a little bit more than me in some ways. But I just – I just am more – I'm more – I'm more – I prepare for platinums and then don't get them. You don't prepare for platinums and then get and them. And then get them. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say what it is is that I get more platinums than you, but I I don't ever choose a game really because of the platinum one way or the other. Yeah. You know? Because like a good example would be like, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with the Plucky Squire. Um, because I downloaded it and I started, like I, I opened it and for some reason, I didn't start it. I was doing something. Mm-hmm. And then I started looking and I saw a number of people that I follow and some people in the Discord talking about it. And I was like, oh, no, I'm a little worried about what I'm hearing. And I don't know if this really is. It sounds like it's not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I, and then I was like, do I really want to play this? And then I see a lot of people getting the platinum. And I'm like, so is it? Is it not that bad, even though it's not what I thought it was? Is it still okay and it'd be worth playing? And is that why people are platinuming it? Or is it just an easy platinum while still being kind of a man game? <laughs> I, I think it's both because I, I'm not going to go back to Plucky Squire. That's on my list. Um, I think it has the best presentation in a video game that I've ever seen. Yeah. And that's it. 
<laughs> well, that's the thing. From most of what I've heard about it is like the game has got a lot of mechanics, but none of them are very deep mm-hmm. and never really builds on any of them. And then the thing that really got me to stop is for the type of game it is, the fact that I kept hearing people say that the game constantly stops and goes to cutscene and takes control away from you and just does that and does that. And, and I get it. I know it's supposed to be like a storybook. So I kind of get why it might do that. But I think that that's terrible for a game that is essentially trying to work like a Zelda adventure game. Yeah. And it's funny because the game I've actually been playing, uh, one of the games I've been playing, is a game I've had downloaded forever and I just didn't want to start it. But whenever I thought that you didn't have a PlayStation and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, um, actually it was before that. It was before you said yours was dead, but I knew that it was unlikely we're going to keep going. I started playing Tunic and Mm. Tunic is on the surface. If you look at it, you're like, Oh, it's a Zelda clone. And then you start playing it and dude, a, the game is incredible in the weirdest way. I don't think I'm not going to say there's not a game quite like it. I'm sure there is, but I'll tell you, I've never played a game quite like it. And the thing that has me kind of hooked into it is just how much it doesn't give a shit about holding your hand (laughs) and how weirdly obtuse the game is. So what I'm going to say is this game has been out for a while. I am positive. There is a guide to this game and you can probably beat this game and this is probably one of those games you can beat in an hour if you have the guide i've been playing for probably eight hours and every i'll start playing and i'll be like oh, okay i'm figuring something out and then i'll keep going and then eventually you get to a point where like i thought i had it now i don't but here's the weird twitch to the game and i remember this whenever they were kind of talking about it coming out the game tells you what to do only through acquiring pieces of paper that are in the world that you pick up and it's giving you the game manual. And every time you pick a piece of paper up, it unlocks a new page and a couple of the words are already translated, which means on older pages or different pages, those words become translated in this otherwise crazy language. So as you keep collecting 40 pages, eventually you'll be able to read the whole manual all the way through. But as you keep getting the pieces, large chunks of it are unreadable because it's a language that you don't know. Um, and so it's really weird in that regard and everything that you need is just through this very 1980s looking game manual and it tells you random things about what to do and how to play and things you wouldn't have thought about there's no tutorial really you just throw you into the world and like figure Mm -hmm. it out which is cool so I don't want to say too much because I don't want to ruin anything about the game but I've been really enjoying rolling around to the various corners of the map and going through stuff, getting something new and being like, I think I know how this works and how it's going to help me play through. And then like right before I got on to, to do the show with you, I was playing it and I got a new item and I got a few chests with it that I hadn't been able to get. But now I'm right back to, I am not immediately sure where to, what to do or where to go. And that is what I was hoping the plucky squire was going to be not in terms of, not handholdy, but more of a old school Zelda. There's not a lot of story. You're just moving through dungeons and seeing stuff and attacking. And that's what I thought the plucky squire was going to be just with a mm. really interesting presentation. And it seems like it's not that at all. No, it to tell you to kind of explain how easy it is. Um, I beat the first boss while looking at my laptop and not oh, wow. my TV. Um, so, you know, take that for what you will. <laughs> That's pretty rough. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I definitely think anybody who likes, and, and it is interesting because Donovan and I didn't even bring up Tunic to him yesterday. We were talking about games and how it's sometimes fun when a game just doesn't want to tell you what's going on. Like the closest Zelda game actually to Tunic that I can think of is Link's Awakening, which they remade. Mm -hmm. And that is the most obtuse Zelda game that really does not tell you what you're supposed to be doing. It just hopes that you'll remember shit you saw as you were exploring. And then when you get a new item, you'll go back to it and be like, oh, this is this might work here. But it's not, you know, it, it... not to the it's it's far more obtuse than most Zelda games. Cause even Zelda ripoffs like Reverie you pretty quickly kind of know what every item you're going to get is and how it's going to work. And this game is a lot different in that regard. Uh, And so I appreciate that. But uh, Uh, going into... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just say, everything you're saying 
shows how well I know you. And audience, audience, tell Brett to play the Outer Wilds. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was, we were talking about like, oh, I'm not sure what I'm going to play. And I'm like, I promise you the Outer Wilds is up your alley. And then everything you just said describes the Outer Wilds. I'm like, yeah. what? He, he never listens to me. <laughs> well, hold on. I've known about the I'm Outer just Wilds teasing. for, just for a few years. But it is interesting hearing people tell me to play it, even though it's been one of those like on the periphery of like, I think I might play that eventually. I don't well, know when, but I will. It was one of the, I think I said it to you, but it was one of those that I actually went on PSN profiles and checked if you had played it before I recommended it to you because it's so up your alley. I'm surprised you hadn't tried it yet. <laughs> I, Tunic is, and I hadn't played Tunic. It's just been sitting downloaded on my PlayStation for like six months. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but to go into my quick story time, as I was sitting there and thinking, it, there was a series of, of, thoughts going through my head but they were all immediately stemmed off of the what am i going to play since chris's playstation's not out like i'm not having since he's not going to have a ps5 he's not going to be worried about the games coming out so i don't have to worry about buying anything new and then i started thinking do i even want to buy anything new i could start trying to play black myth wukong but i think i want to wait for ps5 pro to see if that irons out some of the little bit of performance issues i've seen people have with it uh, and stuff like that. And I was like, whatever game that I want, I'll probably just play on PS5 Pro and I'm willing to wait because there's other things I want to do uh, or there's other things I might want to do. And so I, I was like, you know what? Now's the time. I thought Chris doesn't have PlayStation. I can't play Space Marines with him. I don't know what's going to happen, but you know what? I'm going to go and I'm finally going to download Persona 5. And so I went to your account, did Persona 5 Royal, started letting it download, and I knew it was going to take a while. And so I was like, what do I want to do in the meantime? And I was like, I want to try and figure this out. And I think, I don't think that's when I started Tunic. It might have been, but I don't think. I think that was different. But eventually I landed on, I've been wanting to play The Order again. And so this is the great thing. I didn't say any of this to Chris. And I thought Chris is going to be really surprised when he eventually sees that I'm playing Persona 5. But I'm not there yet. I'm waiting. And I pop in the order and I start playing it. And out of the blue, I get a message from Chris that says, no fucking way. (laughs) And I knew it was on Discord. And I knew without even needing to ask exactly (laughs) what you were saying about So, yes, Chris, I'm on my fifth playthrough of The Order 1886. <laughs> I saw that, and I was just like, oh, Jesus, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about halfway through it. <laughs> so, uh, when I get done, I will continue with Tunic, but I will start Persona as well. Mm. Did you come up with a second game for me? As I've told Brett, I agree that if he does actually play persona 5 i will finally play shadow of the colossus <laughs> and because the f- trade is not fair i have offered him a second round pick <laughs> so to stipulate a little bit more chris's exact words where if you play at least an hour of persona 5 royal <laughs> i will play shadow yeah, of the colossus and fixed. then secondary message i'll even let you add a second game because that trade is not fair <laughs> So Shadow of the Colossus is definitely a great one. I'm glad that you brought to that on your own. That's really mm. good. Uh, if I was going to throw another game out there, I'm trying not to immediately want to say The Last Guardian because it's the same oh, developer. And I'm please just don't like, do that. Yeah, and I think realistically, knowing what you like about games, I think you actually will like Shadow. Mm-hmm. I don't think that you would like The Last Guardian or Ico as much. Okay. Because of the differences in how they are actually intended to be played as games. They're more puzzle games with less combat, whereas Shadow is a puzzle game, but the puzzle is the combat. Okay. And and I like that. That's what makes Shadow cool, is that the entire game is... And it's got a good story, interesting setup and whatnot, but <clears throat> I haven't quite landed on one. Part of me wants to say Deathloop. Oh. <laughs> okay. But... Give it time, and we'll come back around yeah, to it. I mean, uh, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I've just been replaying The Order and enjoying it again, and also still finding the parts of the game that are egregious and worth being like, oh yeah, this is kind of dumb. Like Every time I play the game after the first time, every time it makes me move a weapon around or a watch around just to look at it for 
10 seconds i'm like this is so stupid <laughs> i just always like i can never visualize like a man walking into a house and going oh and like flipping and well, rotating and you know what gets me about it as much as i love that game what gets me about it is the first couple of times that you do it there's actually a reason for you to do it. You're looking for an area that it wants you to hit triangle on so that you'll interact with it. Almost yeah. like classic Resident Evil games, right? Where you mm-hmm. go in your inventory, spin it around and hit or like murdered soul suspects where you can move <laughs> it around and find the the memory or whatever on it. Yeah. And I don't mind those things. I think that's cool because there's a use for it. What mm-hmm. gets you is that the beginning of the game has those. And then as you keep going through the game, it's just like, isn't this a cool thermite rifle? Isn't this a cool pocket watch from Sir Percival? Isn't this a cool blah, blah, blah? And it's like, <laughs> this is kind of stupid. <laughs> and yeah. it would be a lot different if it just had you do it like once. If it had you just go left and right and then it moved on, it would feel so much more intuitive. But instead, you do left and right and then it doesn't stop. And you're like, I guess I got to spin this fucker around a lot <laughs> until it finally thinks <laughs> I've looked at it in depth. Mm-hmm. And the one that gets me the most all the time is when you're in Whitechapel and you pick up a fucking apple to throw at somebody. <laughs> and I'm just like... Why? I, I get, yes, it's a very good looking apple. <laughs> <laughs> um, but while we're talking about that, you know, I'm often, I've said a few times this year and even late last year that there's a lot of games that are very proof positive that games don't really need to look better. And the entire time I'm playing The Order, I keep thinking to myself, I genuinely don't know why anyone cares to make a game look much better than this. I'm not saying there aren't games that look better, but it's it does everything. And I actually think Banishers and The Order, The Order is still a little more AAA. There's a little more budget. But I think a lot of what I, when I looked at Banishers and it was going, I was like, this feels like how Naughty Dog should have progressed in terms of realism. And I enjoy Naughty Dog's real crazy realism and whatnot, or, you know, their artistic realism. But there's times where I'm like, I don't really know that I needed anything more than what Banishers has on offer or The Order has on offer because the performances look exactly like you'd expect. They're very believable. You have nuance. There's great depth of field, stuff like that. And it just feels like, why are we spending so much money on games to continuously try making them look better when we've already hit a part where... They don't need to really look better. And that's kind of why on the PS5 Pro thing that I like that it's more about games already look good. We're not trying to make them look better. We're trying to make them feel better. We're trying to get you to 60 frames per second more often without having to sacrifice the visual. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a great selling point in my opinion. So um, that's been cool. So I've been enjoying playing those uh, and Space Marine's been great and I really enjoy that game. Uh, My brother has been playing it like crazy and beat it and told me I need to get back on it. So now that... uh, now that that's still an option for us, maybe we can set up another time to jump on that and play it. But for the empire, um, for the empire, yeah, I, I think I, there's a couple more games I want to talk about. Um, one of which being Time Splitters. No, oh, um, yeah, I, I'm curious to see your thing on here because you're gonna make uh, you're gonna make a couple people angry potentially because yeah. it's a very beloved series. And uh, I guess hot hot fucking take. I think Time Splitter sucks. <laughs> All right, now I'm willing to let you make the statement. That's not a problem. Now you got to quantify it. I'm just saying, Time Splitters is not made for the modern audience. It's definitely not. <laughs> well, and the, and I think that's the thing. As much as I was going to make a joke, like I do think that's the issue. Is that for me? Who, first of all, every time someone t- said Time Splitters, I thought Time Crisis. So every time uh, I was like, yeah, gun, light I, gun game. yeah, the old light yeah. gun game. So every time someone was like, oh, I love time splitters. I was like me fucking too. And then I turned this on and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Uh, <laughs> but I'm like, okay, screw it. Like there's a bet going on in the, in the, in the discord. Like we'll play through the series. And I'm like, I'm almost done with time splitters one. I just, I have no interest in going back. I am not having fun. Um, I can see the appeal back then. But I know yeah. better, you know? That's the problem with it, is I know better. And it's not... The the thing to keep in mind is, like, out of a lot of people, I think I would be one of the more... I'm more willing to accept stuff. I play a lot on my PS3. I was just playing Dino Crisis. Like, that's an old-ass game. 
I just think this, I can't imagine this was well designed even for back then. Like, it's beloved because it's, I can see it being fun, but it, I don't understand how you can argue this is a well made game. I can see it being I, fun, but it's I not well made. There's a thing. Look, so <laughs> Dino Crisis has got locked cameras. And I think that means that even though Dino Crisis is a 3D game, it solves a lot of the weird parts of some 3D games when you started getting into full 3D camera control. And I think a lot of what makes Time Splitters feel weird is that it's a shooter, which is a genre mm-hmm. that is very much toward things that you expect, like mini maps and stuff like that, um, radar, any kind of things like that. And I do think that game has got sort of wonky camera control in comparison because it was a PS2 game and pretty much all PS2 games had odd shooting. They never felt right. Even like what I think is probably the best shooter on the PS2, EA's Black from Criterion, still kind of feels weird. Uh, And I don't know what that is. I, I don't... It shouldn't be a power thing. I think it was just people trying to figure out how to make shooter games without having made them. That's why for a long time, Halo was the shooter on console, right? It was the one that everyone loved. People played Brothers in Arms and, you know, Medal of Honor and and Call of Duty and whatnot. But yeah, Tom Slitters is a very interesting game. And I did like what I played whenever I used to play. But it's not a series I super love like some people do because I've never been able to beat one because I never owned one. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I've been interested to hear you coming into it and saying that because I like I do kind of remember it, and in my memory, if I think about it with a modern eye, I can see how jank it would feel. Yeah, and I think the one thing I said to you, which I think is a salient point, is that they know that it sucks because the guns aim for you. Like you don't have to like ADS or whatever they would call it back then. Like the mm-hmm. guns, like you'll see, like you you just have to hold R two. And like you'll make it through the levels. So look, I and it's not something I don't begrudge anyone who does like it from a nostalgic sense, but I think going as someone who didn't has nostalgia for an entire other series, <laughs> um, it just didn't hit for me. So it was a little disappointing. But yeah, I, I, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, but hey, that 5,000 points was too alluring for you to not give it a try, huh? It certainly was. And maybe I'll go try two or three or Future Perfect, and maybe those are better. And then I'll go, hey, screw it. Like, I want, I'll get one. But well, it's, it's worth noting that uh, I think Time Splitters one is like a 2002, 2000. I can't even remember when that game came out. Um, it's pretty early on, so you would hope that Time Splitters 2 is considerably better. Time Splitters came out in 2000, dude. Yeah. So Time Splitters 2 came out in 2002, and Future Perfect came out in 05. I bet Future Perfect probably plays pretty damn well. That was yeah, on the cusp so. of... That was on the cusp of... I mean, 360 games were coming out that year, and 360 has good shooters. What I was going to say is it was interesting that you're saying like you play a lot of PS3, and I'm I get that, but also... PS3 is where most of the modern game design stuff set in. Yeah, I guess the only reason I bring that up is because I don't want people to be like, "Oh, you, it's hard. You can't go from only PS4 and PS5 to sure." Blah, blah, blah. No, I'm like sure. in the modern age, like I'm going back to older games, and yeah. e- even still, like I've, I almost I'm halfway through Dino Crisis. Fucking terrible mm-hmm. timing for that, but still, um, <laughs> terrible timing. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it's not that I can't go back to them. It's just. I just, I just don't think this is very good. I don't, I don't have a judgment. Well, certain on the rest genres of the series, age so. better than others. I think that's just naturally, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Fixed camera, three D games, early three D games are always going to feel better. That's just right. the nature uh, of how they end up working. So I get it. Yeah, but it's, look, it's definitely this man. This man here is an enigma because playing Dino Crisis has made me realize that I like and prefer tank controls for survival horror. <laughs> It is I've known this objectively better. Even going back to Resident Evil Four, I'm like, this is less scary because the tank control, the, the controls not being garbage makes the game less scary. <laughs> it's funny because I, I I don't think tank controls are are garbage or not garbage. They're just a they're a different layer of control. Yeah, I know some people think they're garbage. I like tank controls. Like I think they're yeah. good. Yeah, I don't think and they're garbage, but I especially definitely in prefer. That 
I really like what like, I, and I haven't played Resident Evil Four remake, but I really like what Dead Space remake did with it, and even the original Dead Space, right? Where it's like you can walk while you aim, mm-hmm. but your aim is going to be worse, and you're going to be walking really slowly. So it's more just for like slight repositioning, whereas Resident Evil Four you couldn't do that, right? It's like mm-hmm. I, I think. I've always thought Resident Evil 4 would feel great if I could even just strafe. If once I locked on, if I could just move left or right a little bit, I would. that would fix a lot of the issue. Because sometimes in Resident Evil, you set up and you're like, I got to barely move and set up again. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and it, just feels, it just feels a little... It's not, again, not garbage, but it feels like, okay, there's no real... You just arbitrarily limited it to this, which is fine, because limits create things that people like, like tank controls. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's why some people don't like it. Yeah, I don't so. know. But I don't know. Yeah. If, is there anything else? I've I've put a little bit of time into a, a couple things. Um, Tales of Vesperia. I played some of. Um, I went back Ooh. to Dragon Age Origins. Tales of Vesperia. I'm not very far in that game. I don't know how much I'll play. Um, but the dog is a fucking incredible character. And it's a different Tales game too. That was a yeah. that was a 360 exclusive originally. It was. Yeah. Yeah. The one At time, a time where that was not normal. <laughs> yeah, it was Tales of Vesperia and Blue Dragon on the on yeah. the 360, and then that was it. But um, yeah, I know you had said there were a couple of games you were interested in. I've it's been two weeks, man. I forgot all everything. No, but. I mean you've you've covered a lot of them. I've just been looking at your. Much like I guess you did me, I've been looking at your Discord and just seeing mm. random things come across your screen and being like, okay. <laughs> and first thing I noticed is like Chris was talking about how he's gonna knock down games and be on them hardcore, and then and now he's just playing every game under the sun. <laughs> so I, I've really but Chris, tried, but nothing's connected. Let's get uh, let's get moving on. Uh, first thing I want to go ahead and talk about as we jump into the news uh, is to let everyone know that Silent Hill Two we've known would be a PS5 exclusive, uh, but now they have confirmed that it will be a PS5 exclusive until October eighth, two thousand twenty five. So don't expect an Xbox version until then if you were on that side, um, and that means that it has a full year of. Uh, of exclusivity, which is not that surprising, but a lot of things have been moving towards six months. Now, there's a secondary conversation I think is worth having here, and Chris sent me the uh, the links to it, and it was where earlier this week, something we've kind of known before, uh, it's been talked about or been teased a little bit, but Square Enix in a recent conference call um, talking more about their multi-platform strategy has said that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth uh, and Final Fantasy XVI sales, uh, both of those games, did not meet expectations. And now here's the thing. We know that Square is a company notorious for saying, oh, this game didn't meet our expectations and then having insane expectations. But I actually think these games are interesting choices because if you look at what Final Fantasy VII Remake did on PS4, with keeping in mind set that PS4 was very late into the gen and had over 100 million units at the time of that game released. There's and, and came out came out in the middle of COVID. When and everyone it did come home. out. Well, it came out like literally when COVID started, which is worth noting. Yeah, yeah. Well, everyone was at home. That's exactly that's one of the my it's, favorite game because of of COVID. You know. Like, yeah. So that is something definitely worth noting, but it's also a, a mixture of. Its exclusivity stra- strategy worked really well on a system with more than 100 million units out about. Mm. Um, Final Fantasy 16 sold really well right out of the gate and then halted almost immediately. Like everyone who wanted it kind of bought it day one. <laughs> and that was interesting because you look at it and you're like, okay, well, it's not terrible sales. PS5 is in a much different spot. Sony paid them. Maybe it's not too bad. Uh, but then Rebirth comes and there's, of course, more playstations out there's around 60 million right now out and about more than that but at least at the time of release it was around 60 million and this game sold uh less than half of what the original did uh and so when you start looking at it you kind of have to go yeah they they actually had reason they based their expectations somewhat off of what the previous games did. And so for 16, I think it's fair to compare it to 15, which was a monstrous seller. 15 Mm -hmm. sold like more than 10 million units. Um, 
And then I think seven rebirth is fair to compare to seven's performance. I don't necessarily think there's a clear connection between seven remake and 16. I don't think that that's necessarily the same, but there's reason to look at rebirth and expect it to sell somewhere around what remake did. If you made the game that you should have. And clearly from a reception standpoint, they did. Um, but sales wise, it does, it, it hasn't taken off. Um, so with that in mind, Chris, I mean, this is kind of a thing where we're seeing Square say that they regret going this route, and yet we're seeing Capcom do a full one-year exclusivity window on something like Silent Hill 2, which here's the, the reality is, is we don't know how much Silent Hill 2 being made has to do with Sony. We don't know if Sony helped fund it or if they just paid for exclusivity afterwards. Konami. Um, yeah, not Capcom, sorry, Konami. Um but with all that in mind, I think it's uh, it, it's worth kind of looking at here and seeing what do you think is going on here? Do you think we're going to see more people kind of regret the exclusivity strategy, or do you think that this is a problem exclusive to Square? Uh, I think it's a problem exclusive to Square. Um, and I, I think, I don't know. I, I, this is not about Xbox, really, but I think the thing for me is like it just fell flat on PC, Everybody knows people don't buy games on Xbox. So like, what are you hoping to gain? 20,000 more sales? Are you going to you going to write off the Xbox version like Sony did to Concord? Like I don't really get I think the problem is like maybe make spend less money on your games. Cuz like that's the thing. You can see in 16. I just got the platinum. Okay? So I can talk from a place of experience. You can see how much money is in that game. And I don't think it's necessary. The game is very bloated. It's a great game, but it's so bloated. And it's like, take away the year you had 50 people making all these shitty side quests and streamline the game. You know, I think the problem is Square spending too much money and then they're like, oh, well, we're not making enough money back because we spent three hundred billion dollars on Final Fantasy 16 and Clive's chin hairs. But uh, we didn't put it on Xbox, so it's PlayStation's fault. And I think the, the, the thing that interests me is I'm very curious if Final Fantasy 17 is multi-platform. They lost the Sony exclusivity bag. And then what if it doesn't sell on Xbox again? Yeah. So well, that's the thing. I think a lot of it comes down to 16 wasn't a day and date PC title. And I'm almost curious if the last version of Final Fantasy 7, you know, whatever they end up calling it, uh, the third part, I almost wonder if that'll be a day and date PC release uh, oh. and that that's how they adjust it. Because I wouldn't be surprised if Sony's already realistically secured exclusivity for that last piece. And it probably was figured out shortly after the remake, whenever they re upped their deal for remakes exclusivity, which has still not released on Xbox. Something mm-hmm. to know. Um, so I think it's fair to say that that's likely going to hold out, but maybe not considering what's being said here, but this is not really saying about games that are it, games that were already contracted. It, you can't do anything about it. It's kind of like how, so you know Microsoft bought Bethesda and ended up releasing two exclusives on Sony's platforms in the first year that they owned Bethesda. Um, but with all that in mind, um, I wouldn't be surprised if if they at least come back to Sony and go, "Can we renegotiate to where we can do this as a PC day and date release?" And I wouldn't be surprised if Sony's like, "We pay you a little bit less money, and you can go ahead, whatever." Go See, for I guess it. for me, it's like, why would Sony help them? Like, why would Sony, Sony say yes to that? Well, Sony doesn't have to, first of all, but Sony does have a good working relationship with Square. And and reality speaking, if Sony can spend less money and still keep console exclusivity, and Sony talks as though console exclusivity is actually the important part, then uh, I think that's fair. Because isn't Silent Hill 2 also getting a PC day and date release? I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it's console exclusive, uh, if I remember correctly. So we see that Sony's willing to do, you know, day and date for PC. PC and Sony talks about often that PC is not a direct competitor for them. And I think that checks out. We spent a lot of time last week talking about the differences in markets between what people on console want versus what people on PC want. And not to say that there's no overlap, but realistically speaking, I think Sony understands that people who want PC level control are going to buy a PC and they're not getting those sales on PlayStation regardless. So the only way to really do it is 
release your games over there and maybe hope that you can convince them to buy a console. Yeah, <laughs> yeah look, I don't know. Square Enix is a weird fucking company. So. They are. But I just think it's interesting that we're in a year with a lot of still or we're in a time period rather with a lot of uh exclusivity deals and it doesn't seem to be hurting anyone except for square uh but i actually agree with you i think going back to 16 i love 16 i think it's a great game and i know that it's a little bit of a people not everybody like that it bucked a lot of the final fantasy formula um nope so there's that. But I think couple that with the fact that the game was more expensive because of all this extra side quest stuff. And I get it. You, I'm sure they didn't want to be called the next Final Fantasy 13, <laughs> where it's a corridor. And so I struggle with things like this too because if you ask me, take all that shit out. I'm perfectly fine with playing a linear... Uh, take 16 and let, let just let me play the important parts and get all the side content and crap out. I'm happy. I don't mind at all. I know some people. Some people like the side content a lot more than I did. Um, I didn't think it was awful, but I thought it was just like Spider Man one and two side content. It's like, why did you waste development time on this? I'd rather play that side content. <laughs> and, it, and I don't even disagree. And I still think that that's pretty uninspired side content. I agree. That made a that made a two hundred million dollar game be two hundred fifty million. It's like, could you could you just save yourself fifty million and? Yeah, not put that shit in the game, you know. <laughs> but we'll see because what is it? The Spider Man three is projected to cost like three hundred million. Nah, mm, uh, yeah, I think so. Something around Which is that. Crazy, all the same. So uh, there goes that. Though uh, you have a little bit of exclusivity there, and uh, Square maybe becoming more and more uh, multi platform. But we'll see. I'm curious what games are still under contract and uh, how far they'll be willing to go but i i agree with you chris i think at the end of the day pc day and date may be the only thing that kind of is worth something there i don't think you're going to see a big xbox turnaround i'd love to see that change uh but even final fantasy 15 which was the first multi-platform um or it went from being an exclusive when it was versus 13 and then when they re-announced it as 15 it became multi-platform the game sold woefully poor like on on xbox in comparison it was like less than 20 percent of the copies sold i think it was like less than 10 percent of the copies sold were uh, on xbox so we'll see how it uh moves along for him uh the next one was kind of cool and this is a uh Vita IP coming back from the graveyard. So Freedom Wars Remastered announced for PS5, PS4, Switch, and PC. Uh, Bandai Namco and the original developer Demps have announced that Freedom Wars Remastered, a remastered version of Sony Interactive Entertainment's 2014 Vita action RPG, um, as well as all DLC content, will be launching January 9th of next year, uh, or rather in Japan, January 10th worldwide. Um, this is crazy. This is a game I never thought that we'd see again because I thought Sony just wouldn't do anything with it. And this is yet another time where Sony has just relinquished an IP that they owned back to its original people and just said, do what you want to with it. Um, here's the interesting part about this, though. In a time where we're right off the back of Sony saying that they don't have enough original IP, they literally just gave an IP they owned <laughs> back to somebody. But... Supposedly they just I, licensed it. I got that wrong when we were talking. Really, about it. I, th- I swore they owned the rights to Freedom Wars. Sony, Sony does. very. Oh, okay. So they just licensed it from Sony. They didn't yeah, transfer they it back. It. I thought because they they had said so. When I was reading when it was announced, it was like the guy making it was like, oh, they given us the license. That was clearly mistranslated at least a little bit because they did give them the license, but they didn't. Give them the license. You know what I mean? And that makes more sense. Like, hey, you, we don't want to put the money in it, but we'll make money off of you if you want to spend the money on it. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, why wouldn't they be doing that? You know, it's almost like go be like Disney is doing that, right? Hey, oh, EA, you want to make Iron Man? Sure. You know, you Skydance, you want to make Black Panther? Spider or uh, Sony, you want to make Spider-Man? It's like, hey, Harmonix, you want to make Proper the Rapper? <laughs> I think what will be interesting to see from something like this is if Sony would be willing to extend this even further. Say this remaster does well, mm-hmm. and Dimps and Bandai are like, we're down to do a Freedom Wars 2. I wonder if Sony would be like, okay. And I think what gets interesting there is if Sony does own the IP and they're allowing someone else to work with it, then 
a remaster of a game that already came out and did pretty well is not big. It's not a risk on the IP. Letting someone make a new game with your IP that may not be of a certain quality can be risky if you actually want to retain ownership of the IP. You may run the risk of making the IP even less popular than it already was. But I don't know. I think is this, this is a cool move all across the board. It surprised the hell out of me. It did. It surprised me, and I wasn't even a huge fan of it. I think we were we were playing Space Marine at the time. I was like, dude, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is this coming to Xbox? No. That makes more and, sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes that, sense. But again, I think... It, <laughs> yeah... Yeah. Well, because my question was like, is this going to be the Sony's putting their games on Xbox thing? Is like, their <laughs> Freedom Wars is coming out, but no, clearly not. Because that was my curiosity for the sequel is like, would Sony gr- let Namco Bandai do a sequel and also put it on Xbox? And then if they didn't, what's the point of putting the original on Xbox? So the remaster. No, I agree. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I think this will be an interesting thing to see come out because this is a cool game with a lot of neat ideas. But at the end of the day, it still is a Vita game, which means yeah. it had to be limited in design to work within the Vita's limited controls. So it'll be cool to see if they're going to go a little more in depth with it and fuck with the mechanics based on the new buttons that they're going to have access to, like mm. a left click and a right click on the analog sticks, L2 and R2. Um they're yeah. having to move things off of the touchscreen. So it, they're going to do a, some work to it. It's just how mm-hmm. in-depth do you really want to get? I'm glad you brought that up, though, because I think that's an important point, is I've heard a lot of people describing this as PlayStation's Monster Hunter. And, like, it's in the same genre, but do not sure. go into this expecting, like, oh, you know, I'm not going to get Monster Hunter Wilds. I'm going to get Freedom Wars. Like, don't fucking do that. But, yeah, they're but, very different games. Because, like, a good example of that is, like, Sony had multiple Monster Hunter-like games. Soul Sacrifice was one of mm-hmm. them, which I'm very curious to see if we get a Soul Sacrifice remaster from someone now. That would be really interesting to see. Um, but between that, you have Soul Sacrifice was one of them. Um, they ended up having um, uh, Tukadin. I think is what it was called. I never ended up playing it, but it was kind of av- advertised that way. Uh, Ragnarok Odyssey Ace or something like that was one of those style games. And Freedom Wars was one of them. So once uh, once Monster Hunter left being exclusive to Sony's portables and went over to, to 3DS, Sony was like, we've got to get that type of game on our system because people have that expectation from PSP. Um, and that's always been wild because I don't know if you remember when they were first announcing the PS Vita and it was still called NGP. Mm. They did a uh, tech demo of Monster Hunter uh, Freedom Unite or something like that. One of those where it was like, hey, we're, we're running this game's engine on the on the NGP. Look at how much better it looks and look how it runs and what it allows us to do. And then we never got a Monster Hunter on that system. <laughs> it was really weird. Uh, I think we did get one Monster Hunter, by the way. I think it was a. I think it was the MMO Monster Hunter in Japan only. So weird times, but cool to see this come back around. And I'm curious to see what other games might be coming back from Vita, which has a lot of interesting, unique IP, but most of it has ended up getting around. Some way or another, yeah. I'm gonna out, like, tear away. I'm gonna put one out into the universe. I don't think it'll happen because they're making Spyro. Um, give toys for Bob Little Big Planet and just move on. Yeah, it's interesting because Little Big Planet has been, um, uh, Lord, what is the it's the people that made Crackdown 3 and so- Team Sonic Racing and they made Sackboy, uh, they made Little Big Planet 3. Uh, what is that developer called? I, I can, know it, but I can't think about it. Um, uh, Sumo Digital. I didn't even have to get all the way the through one. there. Sumo Digital. And here's the thing. This is a crazy talk. I, I beat Astro ninjas. Bot and got the Platinum. We didn't even talk about that, but I beat <laughs> Astro Bot and got the Platinum. A lot of Astro Bot feels a hell of a lot like Sackboy A Big Adventure. <laughs> Mm. And I thought that was really interesting because Sackboy Big Adventure wasn't nearly as popular, but it, I, I say this with love. I thought both games were excellent, but Sackboy did not rate nearly as high. And I think it's because it's not circle jerking PlayStation the entire time. 
Yeah. It, it, it sort of is, right? Because you can dress Sackboy up as various characters, but it's not baked into the game. Like, you're not flying around on a PS5 or a DualSense and rebuilding the PS5 and saving all these characters, which is great, and I loved it. But I'm just saying it goes to show how much that aspect of it is giving it extra points, even though fundamentally it doesn't change anything about what the game is doing. Yeah. I also played Astrobot, so... Yeah. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, at the risk of getting in trouble, I think Astrobot's kind of boring, but I'm not a platformer guy. You guys know that. So, yeah. Uh, well, as we were talking about, right, the thing about Astrobot is, is it's casual platforming until yeah. the. Until the challenge levels, which are pissing some people off because there are people who are upset that they feel like they want to get the platinum and they can't because they can't beat the challenge levels. And See, I, it, there is something to be said about the fact that you jump into the challenge level and if you've been playing this game up until this point, you've had a lot of cool mechanics and ideas, but no real challenge. And then suddenly the challenge levels are legit hard. <laughs> yeah, but but I thought, again, I've got to go back to Sackboy a Big Adventure had the exact same thing. The Nidden Night Trials were hard and none of the levels were. And the final Nidden Night Trial is insane. And I have yet to be able to beat it. <laughs> it's the reason I don't have the Platinum in that game because I was like, I'm not even going to bother with the co-op stuff if I can't beat this fucking 20-minute level. Do it. Do I it. thought about it. But I about yeah, it. I don't know. Crash is... I, I like Crash 4 more than I like Astrobot. Sorry, guys. Crash so, 4 is a better game than Astrobot. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad that I didn't have to get you know kicked over to Xbox. And Island I like Astrobot, but okay, let me say this: I think it's I think it's a better game. It, it mm. fits into what I like about platformers more. Astrobot was fun, but it was it was only engaging in the platinum grind where you actually had to play the hard levels. Yeah, en- engaging For- that's a little too damning. But you get what I'm saying. I felt most at home of like this is what I love about platformers well, when I was playing the hard shit. You know, I I think the regular levels show you that Asobi when making Astrobot knew where their bread was buttered because the regular levels are just go find the bots. Yeah, it doesn't Which matter. They yeah, hide sure. decently well. Like it's really and cute. I like the hidden level mechanic and stuff. It's cute. Oh, you muted. Oh, I hit the space bar with my pinky. Um, but like going to find Deacon and just knowing John Garvin was seething as I was Deacon was twerking or whatever he was doing. But I was like, this was fucking great. Like this was really cute. And like doing that whole level and going into I think it was it was advertised, so I think I can say like the God of War level. And I was mm-hmm. like, This is awesome. There's there's that one moment. I won't spoil it, but it, it is it was the f- only moment of this sounds weird, but like oh, true joy I've had playing a video game in a long time. I don't know if you remember that, but it was like the little side area, and it does something that God of War does that everyone made fun of God of War for. I was like, that was fucking awesome. But other than same, that, same. I was like, this is just not. This is it, it's I, great. I laughed out loud when I looked over and saw it in camera view. I was like, no fucking way. <laughs> but just, and then I went and did it, and I was like, here we are. This is awesome. Yeah, I was like, this yeah. is great. But outside of Which that, actually, like, I thought, like yeah. Leads me to a, a this is we're gonna have a short sabbatical here. We're done with this topic before we hop into the next one. Um, playing Astrobot, this is where we differ. Mm. I enjoyed playing Astrobot, even though it's casual. I like that. It's exactly what I like about like the Lego plat, the, the Lego yeah. games I was playing. Right when I did Lego Batman, and that game is not hard. It's fun. No, it's fun, and, that, and that's cool. And so playing Astrobot made me actively more excited to see how Lego Horizon Adventures comes uh, comes about, and seeing a date given to it today i'm very happy about because i'm i actually want to see how they do that but where i got to was the 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 every galaxy has got the final level where it's a level inspired by the character they choose to highlight and so as you mentioned there's a god of war one and you are essentially every one of the levels takes the primary mechanics of those games and gives them to you some are far more in depth than the other um and it was really cool seeing them kind of approach some of these games because the the levels that were really oriented toward it, I'm not going to lie, I think you could very easily remake God of War. And that's essentially what Lego Horizons Adventures is. But you could very easily sell me Bot of War as just an Astrobot remake of God of War 2018, and I would happily buy it and play the entire thing. It was, it was that 
in depth enough to where you felt like you were playing God of War, but it was simplified enough to be more family friendly. And if Sony wants to do things like make people God of War fans, but even ones that aren't old enough to be interested in the intricacies of God of War, that's how you do it. And I'm curious to see if that's what they're doing with Horizon. All the kids that like robot dinosaurs but don't give a shit about, you know, the morality of whether or not humans should have been killed by their own creations. <laughs> but like, hey, just come do it in Lego. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, see that's me. There's a few levels in particular where I was almost like, are they Outside of the challenge levels, the most interesting levels in that game are those five ending levels, and two of them in particular, three of them, I guess, are incredible in how they were able to pull it off. I don't even want to save them because I do want to save for anyone who has the feeling, but one of them blew me away. I never would have thought that would be the final one, uh, and I could not believe how well done that level was. It felt like playing a level from that game, but just if they were to make a new one, blew my mind yeah i'm very very excited to see if any of the interest in that let sony go we're going to start making smaller games again and use astrobot as a test ground to get people interested in old games that have been dead ip for a while herman holst just walks into the ceo's room like i'm going to make small games again puts on his red playstation hat and moves on (laughs) Make um, games small again. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I could actually get behind that hat. I would wear that hat. Yeah, yeah, I'd get behind that. I, um, I wish more games were <laughs> were reasonably linked. Yeah, uh, I think I don't know. I think it would be super interesting if something we'll talk about later. Well, I guess it's a bad example, but if the other rumored remake was just an entire Astrobot. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? Yeah, maybe that maybe. would be cool. Like, think about a Sobe, maybe not even a Sobe, but it's one of their teams being like, "We're gonna remake our old games for a younger audience." So we're gonna make Days Gone for Astrobots. Could you imagine like an Astrobot horde? <laughs> yeah, dude, that would be sick. It'd be great. But and they that's will the never thing is, yeah, and and John Garvin would be just yelling on Twitter, <laughs> <I can laughs> which is worse because I like John Garvin, or at least I, I still do. I just think he's really choosing to to fight a pointless battle here, and yeah, I know it's, like, it's probably because he feels belittled because he got kicked away from his own character and he's seeing people do it. But that's so dumb. Yeah, <laughs> like I don't know. I mean, listen, the thing is, like, Jaffe's doing the same shit, and I like Jaffe more than I like Garvin. So, like, it's very much like, guys, what you guys are the ones who made shit for Sony. So don't be upset now. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. It's interesting to see, but uh, we got that one done. Let's hop into after Concord's pretty brutal failure. We have. Uh, a turnaround story of, of some sort uh, with Helldivers 2. So Helldivers 2 has continued to be, look, it was a overnight internet sensation. And then it came down to very normal numbers for a game of its ilk. Um, but following the recent Helldivers 2 1.001.100 update, tens of thousands of players have returned to the game with it seeing a 986% increase in its player base. Um, and I'm curious as to what's causing this. I almost wonder if Concord did what I was talking about, where it recontextualized everyone to, you know, Helldivers is pretty good. Maybe those updates weren't that awful. <laughs> Maybe them balancing the guns again didn't ruin the game. Well, but it's interesting okay. to see this. Problem with your theory, because um, friend of the show Sean is playing Helldivers, and sure. what they did to get their player base back is they unbalanced all the guns again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you are correct. They so, definitely did. <laughs> what fixed it was making the guns fun to use again. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. A lot of even like you said with Sean, a lot of my personal friend group, like Saul, started playing it again. Big Seth started playing it again. Uh, you know, there's about six or seven of them that have all hopped back into it. Uh, and so it's it's cool to see this coming back around. And uh, I'm not too surprised. Hell Divers continues. I've always thought Hell Divers will survive. Mm-hmm. It's just 
some people are going to look at Helldivers as a failure because it didn't maintain its player count that it had at its absolute height. And I was never so crazy as to think it was going to do that. My curiosity was just, is it going to be able to sustain? And I think it's shown that even when they're pissing people off, like all online games do when they do balance patches, ultimately the game will continue to just be successful enough to warrant the game being out and to warrant Arrowhead continuing to work on it, which is all they really need. So be curious to see, but this is a, it's a good turnaround when you look at how badly Concord did. I'm sure Sony's really happy with a bunch of people coming back and very likely buying some of the new uh, war bonds. Could you imagine if Sony's like, you know what? We fixed Helldivers. We can do this again. <laughs> Concord 2.0, baby. We've broken all the guts. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that's the sauce. You got yeah. to unbalance all the guns. Nothing it's is chaos fair. out there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That's There's a lot about that Helldivers that continues to surprise me, like the fact that Helldivers in many ways is like the antithesis of what Concord was trying to do. Because Helldivers, you buy the war bonds, and then the war bonds themselves literally are tied to progression. You want to buy the war bonds so that you can get new weapons and new kit. And you almost need to, and I'm sure as they continue to update the game, there's going to become weapons that are only in war bonds that you're going to be like, I, I need to have that to be maxed out. So I'm going to go buy this war bond and work towards it so I can get that gun so I can be part of the current meta. And Concord was just like, no, you never buy anything. It's all, you know, we just give it to you. It's cosmetics. <laughs> yeah. I, it was really, it was very different in how they chose to approach it. Uh, and I really thought it was just Sony kind of spreading it out and being like, we're going to try every one of these monetization things to see which one players seem to gravitate toward the most. But I actually think the lack of monetization was also part of what made Concord rough. Because I almost wonder if day one they had a, a, a good selection of character skins to be able to solve the character designs that people didn't like, you might have immediately been able to get around the one of the biggest complaints, which is that the game didn't have good character designs. Have a couple of skins that let people change the way that the characters look, bam, you got it. Yeah, I, I thought it was kind Might of be insane. oversimplifying it, but it no, couldn't have hurt. I thought it was crazy <laughs> they didn't have it, so I totally agree. Yeah. All right, Chris, we got one last thing we're going to talk about before we hop into the state of play recap and keep going. And that is uh, the 30th anniversary collection that PlayStation announced uh, for all the PlayStations, the controllers, dual senses, and even some surprise items. So if you've been living under a rock and didn't know, uh, the 30th anniversary of PlayStation is this year. And I had a suspicion that they were going to be doing a console in PlayStation 1 gray colors, which is why I decided to promptly post, <laughs> list my, uh, my PS4 20th anniversary console on eBay, which sold almost immediately for $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> because I knew it. And it was the day after it sold is the day they announced this. So this is pretty interesting. So... There is going to be a limited edition PS5 Pro. There's also going to be a limited edition PS5 Digital Edition. Uh, and there's going to be a limited edition DualSense, a limited edition DualSense Edge, and lastly, a limited edition PlayStation Portal. Uh, now, it doesn't completely end there. If you go with the PS5 Pro bundle, this is crazy. You get the PS5 Pro, you get both the plate for the digital version and the color matched plate for if you decide to buy the disc drive. You get a limited edition DualSense Edge with it, as well as a color matched carrying case. You get the normal DualSense that would come with it. You get <laughs> the uh, controller charging stand color matched. And then you get all the other stupid stuff. So this is a bundle that's probably going to be, we'll find out Thursday, but it's probably going to be $1,000 minimum Maybe $1,200, $1,200 max. We'll see. Um, but this is cool. These are available, like I said, starting Thursday. You can go and try and pre-order them. They have the same limitations on how many were made. Uh, there's 12,300 of the PS5 Pros and then a separate 12,300, it seems, of the PlayStation 5 uh, Digital Edition. Um, if you know any different on that, please correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. But as far as I can tell... Each limited edition system has got 12,300, which ups your chances a little bit. <laughs> I think you're muted. 
God damn it, I keep hitting my uh, space bar. I, mean, I thought it was just the Pro Bundle. I don't know, though, for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, they're both limited, but on the website here, it doesn't specifically state it, interestingly enough. And I did go to the website, not the uh, PlayStation blog. I realized I should have. Um, so there it is. Uh, prices were not announced for them initially, but there's been some leaks to show that the PS5 digital uh, version looks like it will be $500. And it also comes with the color match plate in case you want to get the, um, the disk drive with it. So uh, that's cool. The very cool... Um, USB-C that has a housing that looks like a classic PlayStation 1. Dude, I want cord. that. That is so sick. I can't like, believe they didn't do that last time. I know. I almost want to buy the bundle just to get that because I don't think they're going to just sell that cord. My hope was that they were going to include it with every DualSense that Ugh. is colored this way and just bump the price up accordingly. And I'm curious because they also announced that the DualSense price will be 80 which is... $10 more than the standard, if I'm not mistaken. Or I think $5 more than the standard uh, since they've gone up $5. Um, either way, this is cool. But the secondary conversation I wanted to have here is that a lot of the people I saw complaining about the PS5 Pro's price being egregious and ridiculous and anti-consumer were immediately hopping on there talking about how they're going to try <laughs> and get this obviously more expensive bundle. And... Uh, when Donovan and I were talking yesterday, I really thought it was funny that I'm surprised that they did not announce this alongside the PS5 Pro. I think that honestly, just showing the PS5 Pro in this color skew and then saying that this is a limited edition and then putting the price up for the, even the normal Pro, you would set this coolness in people's head because of this and they would be more okay with the $700 just because of how you marketed it. But... There is something to be said about people wanting to spend obviously more than $700 just because you changed the color and made it more limited. And all I will ask of anyone who had this change of heart, mm -hmm. did you really believe in your own complaints before or were you just upset that it was more money than you wanted to spend? It's that one. <laughs> it's it's the thing it's the thing I've been saying this whole time is that the only reason people are mad is because they have FOMO and know that they don't need nor can afford this. So they're upset that it's seven hundred dollars. But like every person that you talk to who actually knows what they're talking about is like, yeah, it's worth it if if that's what you want. But it's not an essential product. And I know that um take it for what you will, but I was listening to an interview with Moore's Law's dead or whatever. And he was oh, saying yeah. it's like um, Sony wasn't going to release this, decided to release it because why the fuck not? And now they're so they're like, we don't care if you buy it or not. We're going to make a profit on it. You you don't need it. I don't need it. Nobody who's going to buy it needs it, mm -hmm. but we want it. Well, and here's and the thing, the right? Thing. It's my big thing was it's manufactured in in a far lower quantity and it is a different system. It does require a different manufacturing process, which means that these things aren't going to be as cheap to make because they're having to make individual, you know, chipsets specifically for the system. So across the board, all elements converge together to give you this idea of this system's price point is reflective of being. I don't think I said it last episode, but since Donovan and I had conversations after we recorded and we kept talking about it, what I had landed on is. Nobody complains about Ford, and I use the, the example of my Bronco because mm -hmm. almost every Ford Bronco is roughly in the $50,000 range. And guess what? If you want to get a Bronco Raptor, which is just a Bronco with a slightly different body design, a little bit wider, a little cooler looking with more horsepower and different suspension and stuff so that you can do more with it, and it's like $70,000 minimum. I think it might even be $90,000 for the Raptor. And I was like, but so I, I was like, my thought was Ford makes those knowing that very, very few people who want a Bronco are going to buy that one. 
they charge a premium for it because it's a limited thing that only a certain subset of the market's going to want. And they don't care if you buy it or not, because realistically speaking, they made the normal Bronco for the people that they want to buy the Broncos. And that's exactly what Sony did with PS5. The normal PS5 is what they want you to buy. And if you decide to buy the PS5 Pro, they're cool with that because they're just getting your business either way. But the one they care about being priced at a way that's going to get market saturation is their baseline model. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, people keep bringing up phones, but it is true. A lot of people go towards getting the iPhone Pro Max, you know, and, and yes, I know it's your phone and I know you do a lot more on your phone than you do a console. But you're also talking about a price jump from a normal iPhone 16. Is that the new one? Mm-hmm. Yep, iPhone 16. 16, I think, is $799 for the base model. And it's $1,500 for the highest end model that you can get. That's a much more significant jump. And most people are still going with the version that's the highest. Or I don't want to say most, but you get what I'm saying. There's a big jump, and the people who want to spend the extra are spending it. Yes, you use it more. I know. But it's also costing. The price difference between them is the price of the PS4 Pro. <laughs> I've never heard it articulated like that. Uh, look, it's... <laughs> I don't know. I there's I don't have a ton more to say about the price, but it's just I've always thought the outrage was ridiculous. Yeah. It's like, uh, <clears throat> are you going to go for this bundle? Just out of curiosity for you, I, I, I've wondered how much up your up your alley this feels. Um, Doesn't strike me as immediately. I, I think I think I said it on Twitter to Ryan. If I did, I would try. And if I did get this, I would never open it. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because, so that's the difference. Like my 20th anniversary, I got, and it was my main PS4 until they came mm-hmm. out with PS4 Pro. No, for me, it's like it's like I have the Persona 5 vinyl, and it's very oh, rare. Yeah. And I refuse to listen to it because it's worth so much money. Like I will never open it. It, yeah. it, it makes me uncomfortable to t- to have it. Yeah, because it's like a four hundred dollar vinyl. Like I'm not opening that. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, yeah, it's interesting. With with hardware, if you take care of it, I tend like you know I sold my twentieth anniversary for a thousand bucks because I had all the original packaging, everything was in great shape, you know. So I get it. It's just one of those things. I am glad that, as far as I can tell, I'm pretty much going to be like for like and selling my twentieth anniversary and getting this one <laughs> if I can manage to get this one. I know that's yeah. going to be difficult well, and that's the thing but, like i don't want to f- fuck with your head but i'm just looking right now inbox is 2400 bucks and that's that's why like for me it's like mm-hmm. the fucking persona 5 vinyl is still worth money if i open it but it's worth yeah. so much More. less yeah. either way yeah it's yeah. worth so much less that i'm like ah, i'm too i'm just too uncomfortable <laughs> touching it so it's, it would be the same with this well, and I'm with you. Like, I, as soon as the PS5 or as soon as the PS4 Pro came out, and I was no longer using that PS4 as my daily driver, I did put it back in the box pretty much immediately because mm-hmm. I was like, "Well, I'm not going to be playing PS4 on that anymore. It would be stupid to just have it sitting out." Right. Like, if I'm using it, I don't mind. I take great care of the things I use, so it doesn't bother me if I'm as long as I'm using it. And I am going to buy this to use it. That's the generally speaking the way that I'm going to go about this. Hey, I respect but if there comes that, a time. But- where yeah, when PS6 comes out, if it's backwards compatible and it does all the things that I that this system could do, this will go in a box and either become a, a collector's thing that I have sitting up on a shelf to be like, look at that, or I'll sell it and let someone else actually have it as a full on collector's. I like being able to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Like the coolest aspects of the 20th anniversary PS4 were the main system having the two zero triangle square XO, like embedded all over all over the system and on the touchpad of the control like that shit was cool yeah um and so well, seeing that, it again here is really nice I, I i like that and i'll definitely have it and, and use it so yeah. I, I hope i get one but you know if but, i don't i'll pre-order the normal playstation 5 pro and go about my day that's why i think <laughs> if i get anything i'll probably buy the uh dual sense edge uh buy a second one but that one see I am actually kind of stoked that they have one in this bundle because that's the kind of thing I would never buy mm-hmm. completely standalone. But as part of this bundle, I'm interested in it enough that I'll pay more to go ahead and have it included in this 
because you also get like the charging stand. So yep. I'm very, I hope I get this so I can finally mess around with the DualSense Edge without having to make an individual $200. I'm going to be interested how you feel about it because I hate playing with my other controllers. <laughs> Outside of the edge? Yeah. Like, I will actively sit here on a wire, which I don't like doing, to not use. Like, I have my pink one. Like, I have this one. I won't use mm-hmm. it. Like, I'm like, I don't want to use that that thing. Um, the edge is just so much heavier. It's got half. Interesting. I love that. What I kind of like about it, just going through, right, is like if I end up having the stick drift that some people have out of them, which is just a modern console thing, it seems. Uh, I like the idea that you could just go buy a $20 analog stick module and slide it in and keep going about your business. <laughs> yeah, that is a good That is a good selling yeah, it's point. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I don't want to spend too much more on that. Um, but yeah, good luck to anybody who's trying to get one. Best of luck to you. I'm, I'm wishing myself luck, seeing what I can get out of it. Uh, but it was nice to see in the state of play today that even if I don't get this, I'll have a good. I'll have a nice way to make my PS5 Pro look at least better than white. Mm. <laughs> so we'll talk about that here in a bit. Uh, and with that, we're going to go ahead and hop into the state of play, which was today. La- you know, announced very short notice and hit today, covering twenty games in thirty plus minutes. Um, and yes, that does include finally a new game announcement from Sony. Yay! <laughs> but I also thought that that was interesting. Um, so let's get into it. First things first, the thing I want to cover immediately, because I think you have the least amount of interest in it, uh, and it just highlights the fact that uh, I have a, a separate story time that's just, so goddamn annoying. Uh, interrupt you quick. Do you have a list so that you're going through so that I can kind I do. of uh Yeah, you want me to shoot it over you? to you? Because I don't, I I remember I watched it twice, but I don't necessarily remember all the game names. So, just yeah, you're make fine. Sure we're on the same page. Um, yeah, so I'm using a uh, a recap list from uh, Polygon. Okay, uh, just one of the first ones that I was able to find that has it all there. Uh, but the first thing I want to throw out there is that starting immediately with games that are. Uh, playable on PSVR 2 and then also having multiple games that were just for PSVR 2. Um, I said that when they did, they chose not to talk about PSVR 2 and the PS4 Pro announcement that it pretty much spoke on how they feel about it. And I'm glad to see that. I think I'm a little wrong and I'm glad because as somebody who has PSVR and wants to enjoy it, um, I really thought that they were just going to let games come out for it, but not spend any time showing them off. Uh, And it was nice to see that they've since talked about the PS4, the PS5 Pro will benefit PSVR 2 and PSVR 2 will be able to tap into PSSR. Developers will be able to use it to improve image quality on VR, which is great. Um, Hopping in and having a game right off the bat, uh, that is able to be played whether you want to play it as it's the Midnight Walk for anybody who was curious. Mm. It's from the developers behind Lost and Random, which I love the style of, but I could not get into the gameplay no matter how mm-hmm. hard I tried. Uh, so I'm curious to give this a try and it's nice to see, bam, right off the gate, we're going to talk about PSVR 2, uh, which leads me to a slight tangent. I think that I was mistaken on which one of my PSVR 2 controllers was messed up or the other one's also messed up now. One of the two. I either sent the wrong one in or both of them were fucked. I don't like the idea that both of them were fucked, but it's possible. So here's the thing, Chris. You were asking me if I wanted to buy yours, but then the question becomes, do I want to spend $350 for yours and then have an extra headset sitting around with no use? Or do I just want to spend $40 more and send the other controller off and wait three weeks to get it back, which is looking a lot better on paper. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I don't suggest you buy mine. Outside yeah, of the fact so, that you should buy mine so I can have $350. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you'd love that. I would. Uh, so yeah, that's something quick I wanted to get out of the way is it was nice to see that. And then while we're on it, I wouldn't mind going ahead and quickly talking about the games that were shown for it, mm-hmm. uh, which was really cool to see. Metro Awakening looks really cool, and I'm glad that that is coming. And I'm glad it's coming this year, but it just pushes me to need to get that controller fixed because this is the type of VR game I want. And there's not as many of these as I was hoping initially. Uh, Horizon uh, Call of the Mountain, for as much shit as I thought I was going to give it as being yet another Horizon game, um, it's some of the most fun I've had on the system so far. And seeing another game that's aiming to be full on, I'm digging that, and I like the 
thought of being able to go through and do that. So mm. we will see. But uh, Chris, a game that you adore is hitting PSVR 2. And yeah. I'm not surprised because the, it, it hit PSVR 1. And that is Hitman 2 or Hitman World of Assassination, rather, which is, I guess yeah, is just right. there. Isn't that this there all Hitman games rolled into one? Yeah, that's one, two, and three in one package. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this, Chris. I know you don't have as much interest in VR, but if you don't happen to have your soul by the time that this hits, would this be something that might push you into maybe just maybe VR? Give yeah. it another try. <laughs> this is, I saw this announced. First of all, I saw this and I'm like, oh, that's it, man. Like instantly. Oh, immediately I knew too. And they were like, it seemed like they weren't saying it for some reason. I'm like, this is just like obviously it, man. But um, I was watching that and I'm like, am I sure I want to sell my PSVR too? <laughs> Which I think is the right thing. And I think the problem is Sony hasn't been able to pull that off consistently enough yet. Mm-hmm. You know, there's also an alien game that's supposed to be coming that looks all right for PSVR too. And I think it's still supposed to hit this year, but we didn't see it here. So maybe not. Um but there's enough VR stuff on the horizon that even if I were kind of in your position, I would be on the edge because the, the reality is is people aren't chomping at the bits to buy them to begin with. You're not necessarily going to find an easy buyer for yours unless nope. you're willing to just take very little money for it. I had it at 400. It's down to 300 now. What do, you have, what do you have it on? Offer up and Facebook. Yeah. And see, the reality is is there's still a decent chance that you're not going to sell it at that price point. No, I'm probably going to have to bring uh, it down to 250 if I want to. And then get the question is is do you want to play Hitman VR enough? You know what I'm saying like yeah. would Metro Awakening or Hitman VR enough be enough to where you go I'd rather just have, you know, would you rather have $250 or $200 or whatever or would you rather have a chance to play those games and everyone who has a VR Sony needs to be trying to not get them to sell it and I think it was smart for them to do PC VR because it at least gives you another opportunity to move toward it and say I'm not using it on PlayStation right now but I can go play Half-Life Alex. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you kind of have that that uh in between. Uh though I'm still surprised Half-Life uh, I I I've never felt so weird about being wrong. I swore Half-Life Alex was going to be on VR too. It's odd. I agree. It's weird. It's a weird thing. And now it's the game they're using to showcase VR on PC. <laughs> yeah, which is weird. It's like you, you're you're going to let them use it in their advertisements to sell VR? Then why can't I play it on PS5? That's kind of my thing, and I I don't know. I'm curious. Um, PS5 so Pro that's the, Yeah, that's uh, the beginning stuff. <laughs> that would actually be interesting. Mm-hmm. Exclusive PS5 Pro games only for VR. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's a few other things. Let's go ahead and talk about the Astrobot DLC was like really the first thing out of the gate, uh, and it looks cool. It was nice to see Helldivers get their comeuppance and, and be recognized there, and it was cool to see Eve from Stellar Blade. I thought those were both cool, and they said 10 bots total, so I'm assuming all the other eight bots are also going to be cameo characters. Um, there's plenty that they did not hit despite hitting a wealth of characters in the uh, Astrobot game, so this is nice, and it being free is cool. So It is cool. Yeah, um, that's good. That didn't move the needle for me. Now we get into a weird conversation. Sony did a lot, specifically from Sony here. And the long rumored off and on, is it happening? Must not be. Oh, never mind. It is. Oh, Horizon Zero Dawn Remastered. This. Man, okay. I'm of two minds about this, and it really kind of struck me. I, I actually like Zero Dawn, and I think it's a better game than Forbidden West. <laughs> and I am Uh-oh. in this mode of, would I replay this? And my immediate thought was, I wouldn't replay this at 60 or $70. And Sony are crazy enough to charge that much for it. Mm-hmm. And so at first I was like, interesting to see. They're, they're basically trying to bring it up to visual parody with Forbidden West, which is a bold choice. And I will say... Kid Aloy looks significantly better than she did in the original game because she looks weird as fuck in the original one. Uh, but all that is, uh, said, I was like, this is an interesting, an odd choice. I don't know why they're doing this. They're really betting a lot on Horizon, whatever. I'm not going to worry about it. And then they said, if you, earn the, if you own the PS4 version, it's a $10 upgrade, which is exactly what they did for The Last of Us Part Two, And they might get me here. 
That doesn't mean that I think that this is a great idea or that I'd necessarily support it, nor do I even necessarily think this game needs a remaster. But at $10 to get it more PS5 specific and replay it outside of just playing the PS5 version, which is using the PS4 Pro build, but at 60 frames per second, Mm -hmm. I'm willing to pay $10 for that. But it leads to the question of why this game? Why now? And what is going on with their choice behind why they are doing the remasters and remakes that they're doing? And I want to slide in the Until Dawn remake as part of this conversation. Because a lot of it, I think, has to do with IP they intend to use. And so the idea would be the synergy between Until Dawn is that they are wanting to do a movie. Therefore, they're willing to do a game that is a remaster. And Mm -hmm. for Horizon, there's a lot of Horizon that they're wanting to do. There's a show upcoming, and I'm sure they're wanting to get the benefits of sales of there. But what do you take on this? Because you seemed excited about talking about this. And I'm assuming, as someone who didn't like Forbidden West and doesn't necessarily have a huge love for this IP, this isn't landing for you. But let's hear it. No, actually, my take is that the second they said nine ninety nine upgrade, I was like, I want to hear no more head ass takes about this fucking game. I don't give a fuck what you have to say about this game because it's ten dollars. Like, I do not care. Waste As of time, upgrade. waste of money. But it, yes, it, Horizon sold like thirty million copies. Everybody fucking has it. Like, yeah, it's, it's a yeah. it's a ten dollar upgrade. Once I saw that, I was like, yeah, I don't care what anybody has to say. Oh, Horizon remakes a waste of money. Yeah, probably. Don't care. Ten dollar upgrade. You just get a better version of a fine game. Yeah, that's it. I don't. I don't want to hear anybody complain. If this was seventy dollars, like I'd probably be on this show. Like, yeah, they can charge what they want. Um, but now I'm like, this is a perfect price. There's literally nothing for you to complain about. I don't want to hear you complain. Yeah, ten dollars <laughs> push. Ten dollars puts it firmly in my area. It's it's what I wish they were doing with Until Dawn, and mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that they're not. Have they said Be- they're not, or have they just not said anything? They've just not said anything. Yeah, which I think is indicative because they said it immediately for this, and they said it immediately for the Last of Us remastered part two, um, and they didn't say it for the Last of Us part one. So. It's, I don't know, man. It, it's a weird one to go off of, but I am ultimately okay with this. But it leads me to a question. Uh, and you were talking about it a little bit earlier, right? Which is that one of the other rumored games for this treatment was a Days Gone remaster, which is yet another game that got a PS5 update so that it could play the PS4 code at max resolution scale and at 60 frames per second, and it has great image quality. It looks and runs really well. Even if it's not a bespoke PS5 game, it's close enough. And those are two games that seem really weird to remaster. I'm with you. The $10 price point makes this at least more reasonable, and it, I think that this will do well at $10. And I wonder if they are primarily worried about banking on people buying it new or if they're really thinking about people making a lot of money off of people spending $10. That's my curiosity. You're muted, bud. Dude, I don't know what's going on. Um, for me, it's one of those things where like the, the upgrade days gone itself was one that I was excited for. Cause I'm like, I'll platinum it again. <laughs> Same. <laughs> that was yeah. it. That like I, I was never like, oh, is that what the hold on? That's what these remasters are for. It just all of it clicked. I'm I'm throwing throwing until dawn out because that that is as far as I can tell for the most part a new game. These are strictly getting three hundred thousand trophy hunters to spend ten bucks. That's all these are for. <laughs> I'm seriously because everything they're gonna do to Days Gone is already done. Other than a PS5 trophy list, that is all these games are for. Um, uh, that at this point, that is I am fully behind the conspiracy that Sony is only making these ports for new players and trophy hunters. That's it. Because otherwise they just have a smart delivery system. But they don't. Because Sony is Sony is smart and knows that I will double dip on Days Gone to Platinum it again. But I will not play the PS4 version all the way through again. But I will play the PS5 version all the way through again. 
maybe, maybe I'm just up my own ass at that with that take, but like well, that seems to be very logical to me. I definitely think that that's part of the thought process because they see how many games that are shit that people will pay a, th- a dollar for to get a quick platinum. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that that's and. and also, a lot of Sony's first-party games have a very high platinum completion rate. Yep. Um, so there's that to be said. I'm sure it comes into play. I think the Until Dawn one gets me because even though it's a remake on a different engine, it looks it looks so much like the original Until Dawn that I I genuinely can't see the, the point because I, 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 I said don't it know. to I, you, but I genuinely uh, think it looks worse. <laughs> Oh, no. At times, I think it looks worse, too. But really, all I'm saying is that at the very least, it looks similar. Mm-hmm. And it has, and that's why I go, why? And it has to be that they're wanting a native PS5 version that's new that they can throw people on whenever the movie comes out. It has to be this weird synergy they're doing. And the reason I say that is Horizon's a big IP that sold 24 million. The original game sold 24 million. And if they can tap into any of that while also growing the IP with people who never played the original but didn't play Forbidden West because they didn't want to jump into a story they were unfamiliar with, this is a this makes sense because people are also about to be able to play Forbidden West with PS5 Pro enhancements. So people who may have skipped out on Forbidden West because they didn't play Zero Dawn can now kind of one two right back into them, which is cool. But I think what's interesting here is why until Dawn, and the the answer has to be that they're doing this movie. And I say that because like why is this not a time to celebrate your brand with something even simpler with like a Killzone collection? Hmm. Right? Why not a kill zone? Now, probably not kill zone one, but why not kill zone two, three, and maybe Shadowfall? Well, I, I think it's to do with exactly what you said, where there is some brand synergy. There was some. Yeah, I, I think it's what, they be, don't plan on making anything new kill zone. No. And therefore, why I put the. And I still think there's an answer as to why you'd put the dev time into it, realistically. Uh, it's just making sure that you're treating your, your fan base for these things well. Um, so they'll continue to want to be loyal customers. But ultimately speaking, yeah, they they're clearly don't have any interest in doing anything with Killzone. Definitely not from Gorilla. So if anyone's going to do Killzone, it's not going to be Gorilla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know. But it's, there's, there's a lot of games that people have asked for. It's like, what? fuck, Infamous 1 remake. I actually think an Infamous 1 remake would do really fucking well. But I think, again... Do they have anybody they're immediately going to throw in another infamous game? Are they going to force Sucker Punch to do that instead of this new game? No. Therefore, we're not going to worry about it. I really think that that's partially what's happening. But then you have to ask yourself, what was the purpose behind Shadow of the Colossus remake? What was the purpose behind Demon Souls remake? This is what I've been saying. <laughs> it's the fallacy of, buy- of buying Blue Point and then being like, go make your own shit. Is the it's the dumbest thing. I don't understand why they did that. Blue Point was a remake team making fantastic remakes. Right now, we could be living in a world where we're like, oh, Blue Point's making a, ma- remaking um, Infamous from the ground up. They're yeah. making Infamous 1 and 2 in one package. I don't know. But instead, we're probably going to get some new multiplayer live service IP from them, and that's insane to Jesus, me. Jesus, I fucking hope not. I don't but get I, that. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Man, I don't know. It, it puts me in a weird spot because I agree. I think th- the reason I thought Blue Point was such a smart purchase is that remaking games takes significantly less time than making new games. And so remaking old games that have a lot of the work done for you and just putting the work towards making them feel modern is a good way to cheaply make a game that you can charge a reasonable price for, even full $70, and bring games back to give them a second chance to let the IP shine without having too much of a development risk involved. Um, and so this is this is why you go to Blue Point. You go Blue Point. People always talk about how much they love Legend of Dragoon. Now's our time. Let's remake Legend of Dragoon. Cool. All right. Uh, people love Infamous, but we don't have anybody else that's on Infamous. Infamous 1 is the roughest of them. It needs the most work. Remake Infamous 1 for us. And it's... I don't know. It's a weird thing where I don't understand why... 
PlayStation, that's why I keep coming back to this conversation about them talking about IP. And I think Sony, more than almost any brand holder, like, you know, in, in gaming, I think arguably maybe Square, but Sony has a lot of IP that they take no effort to do anything with. Mm-hmm. And IP that I do think there is a market for if you budget accordingly. And they just don't care. And it's like you were talking about with Square and Final Fantasy earlier, right? Like if you if you budget out Final Fantasy better, maybe you can keep Final Fantasy being a profitable series. Um, but you have to fight with the market. And where, you, where do you want your game to sit? And maybe nobody wants to put that work in. But PlayStation has so much IP that seeing them waste away certain purchases that they've made. I get the Nixus purchase and I knew that when they did Nixus, it was going to be for PC ports, but you know, what has been weird. Mm. The God of war fucking Ragnarok PC version that just came out was, uh, what is that dev team called? It's like four people. It's not <laughs> Nixus. Shit. Really? <laughs> and I can't think of the name of it. Hold on. Ragnarok PC dev. Uh, it was a co-development between um, Valkyrie. No, a uh, Jetpack Interactive and Santa Monica Studio co-developed the PC version. Yeah, that's and weird. Jetpack Interactive is like four dudes. I'm betting that the reality is Nixus is a well. Did they ever say specifically PC only? Because what you're nope, seeing they did. is I Nixus thought- is doing. The ports and remakes. Remasters. They're doing Horizon. Too, yeah. mm-hmm. They. What was the other game they did? It was a PC game. Was it 18 or was it... Um, it was The Last of Us, wasn't it? Uh, they did The Last of Us, I'm pretty sure, yes. Yeah. So they did the big and I scale think that ones. They also did Spider-Man and Ratchet. I'm looking up there. Uh, that, feels, that feels right. Um, so yeah, they, they've definitely been behind a lot of games. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, they did Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn Complete, Marvel, Marvel Spider-Man, Spider-Man Remastered, Remastered, Miles Morales, Rift Apart, Forbidden West, and Ghost PC, of Tsushima. And Ghost of Tsushima. So Nixus is doing multiple ports at once. Yeah, multiple ports at once, but they're doing the PS4 to PS5 and PC. They are True. not doing the PC ports. Well, they Which, are because Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut well, was, you know, what I'm, was yeah. strictly moving that game to PC. But I get what you're saying overall. But they, oh, yeah. I mean, I was almost curious. Like, you know, if you have a game, if you have a company like Nixus who's good at porting, I almost wonder what, what would you do with them? Is there, could you make them a Blue Point style studio within reason? But I think the answer is you didn't buy them for that. But they said no. They said specifically, but, we don't want to make games when they were yeah, bought. Yeah, which is fine, and that's cool. Yeah. And I think that that makes sense considering what they are and why Sony bought them, which only makes it more weird that Sony buying Bluepoint. And I'm sure the answer is that Bluepoint said, we want to make our own game. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm curious why? to see, and I really hope that whatever Bluepoint comes out with lands for me. But let's keep going through this state of play. I just know that that remastered is... It's going to have people on a, in a weird talking point. Definitely people who don't like Horizon. And that's why I'm curious to see that your answer was very measured. I think that was a, a good response. So, Thank you. So sticking on the Horizon train for a second, Lego Horizon Adventures, a game we've already seen, uh, got another trailer uh, with a pre-order date, which is in October. And the game itself comes out November 14th, hitting this year. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about this other than I think this looks really cool. And I'm curious to finally play it and see how Sony handles these smaller games because it's looking like Sony's biggest successes this year are going to be small, but budget-friendly, family-friendly games. And I am very curious to see if with Jim Ryan gone and these games doing well, if this could push Sony towards finally doing what we're talking about and making sure that some of their portfolio are more budget-friendly games more often so that they can have safety nets for when games like Concord come out and shit the bed. Maybe. So, and I, of course, I don't hope Sony has any more of those, but when you have games like Fair Games coming out, you need to have games that are good counterbalances, games that are cheap to make, that have a high chance of selling well. It remains to be seen if Astro Bot's going to be that game, but it's doing well, it's reviewed really well, and it's selling pretty well so far. It is. And I'm sure that game was very budget friendly. So, 
Um, moving on, we got Monster Hunter Wilds got a release date and a new story slash gameplay trailer. Looks really good, and it's coming a lot sooner than I think a lot of us expected. February 28th, 2025. Uh, game looks good. I'll definitely play it. I don't know if it'll be a day one for me, but uh, it's it's on the radar for me. So. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Monster Hunter is like one of those games that I want to like and just can't do it. Never been able to get it, yeah. No. Uh I don't want to speak much on Dynasty Warriors Origins cuz I just think Dynasty Warriors is not a good franchise or rather it's not a franchise that's ever clicked for me. Uh and so instead of saying bad things about it, I just won't say anything about it and move along. Mm-hmm. Um we already Go talked about it. the Midnight Walk. Hell is Us looks really interesting. It's coming from Nacom. Uh, okay. And I actually think this game looks kind of cool. I I have a question about this game for you. Because yeah. when I first saw this game, you thought it was I Death was Stranding? No. I thought that this was the new Naughty Dog game. Oh, and wh- then interesting. Why? I don't what, what screen Naughty Dog do you? I don't know until there was that one small scene of a puzzle where the character is jumping around on a big clock. And I was like, oh, this is the new Naughty Dog game. Like, that's Naughty Dog shit right there. And then it wasn't. And I was like, okay, well, that's hype. But there was there was something about the way it looked where I was like, is this Naughty Dog? And then I was like, no, they would have had that at the beginning. Yeah. But then they did the clock puzzle thing. I don't know if you're watching the trailer and you see what I'm talking about with that clock puzzle put thing. Dude, if I'm not gonna lie, if Naughty Dog did a thing with you know, when they re- revealed the little like body with the no stomach and the face pulled out, if that yeah. was Naughty Dog working on that, that'd be sick. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I know that they were talking about doing like a fantasy game. I know this isn't probably really fantasy. It's probably more survival yeah, I see what horror. You're talking about where you, it almost looks like the Skyrim claw puzzle. Yeah. I, Weirdly I, enough. I, I don't know how to explain it, but the second that pu- puzzle came out, it was like the the melancholy environment and the yeah, sure. weird, like a little pretentious, you know, talking and their narration is the better word for that. And all it's that funny because as it was going at first, I was like, dude, is someone making like a really interesting analog to World War II and the Jews? And I was like, <laughs> because the, like the body, I was like, and they were talking about mama said monsters didn't exist, but the monsters existed in us. And here's the thing that could very clearly be what this game is actually aiming for. And it's just mm-hmm. doing it through a lot of different things. Uh, but I'm very into the way that this game was presented. I think visually it looks interesting. It does. It looks unique while also having a few looks where like every time they show the guy with his hood on and the little thing coming out, I'm like, why does this feel like Death Stranding meets Ghost Recon? <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I don't know how to say it better than that, but I think this looks interesting. Um, and depending on how the game is fully going out, like I'm... I guess my curiosity is what type of game is it? Is it more of one of those? It, it says it's an action adventure game. So my hope is that it is a story driven linear action adventure game uh, or, you know, it can still be a hub environments, but I hope it's not like a crazy open world thing. So yeah, extremely interested. That's one of the games that'll be on my list. This is like taking the place of what banishers did for me, where it's like, that's my not triple a game that I'm very interested in for the, for the upcoming year. So Banishers did not disappoint me. It disappointed <laughs> and it disappointed in sales, apparently. <laughs> yeah, it did. But it did a really great critically. So um, okay. all right. Now let's let's pivot for a second, Chris. Pivot. Okay. Power World. A game that very recently got into uh, a little bit of controversy uh, yet again is first of all, Shadow Dropped on PlayStation. That was pretty cool. I have Let's no see. interest in this game. But it was cool to see that it was an immediate drop. Thought that mm-hmm. was nice to see. Um, but I'm going to use this as kind of a talk of a. It's cool that Sony got this. Um, I don't really know what was keeping them from get it getting it, but it doesn't seem to be that it was early access because they've announced other games that were early access in this. Uh, so it seems like Sony's willing to let more and more games get away with being early access for them. But they had the controversy they got in this week leads to an interesting conversation, I think, about the idea of patents in gaming and what I'm a little worried about with it. So we all remember when Power World first came out, 
there was a lot of people talking about it was likely going to get a lawsuit from Nintendo over copyright infringement or trademark infringement, neither of which ever came to fruition. And I think everyone led, let themselves feel comfortable that this game was going to be fine. No trademark or no, no lawsuit was going to be coming. And lo and behold, we get a lawsuit filed for patent infringement. And the patent infringement that they claim is about the way that they have went about patenting what a Pokeball is as a device, how you use it, and how once you catch whatever you catch with it, you own it. And they are going off of that remark for this game. Mm. Now, what I think is interesting here is a lot of games have done this. And none of them have been as, as successful as Power World. And it seems like Nintendo is only going after Power World because it has been a massive success. But secondarily, I don't love the idea. And this is like a, a modified version of a conversation we had whenever WB and Monolith patented the Nemesis system. And what I say about that is I don't love the idea of patenting gameplay ideas and mechanics because I, even my wife, as Power World came up on the screen and I brought up that they were, there was a lawsuit and I explained that it was a patent, she was like, she intuitively already had the idea of like, that's terrible for games. Why would they games are going she's like no game is original anymore it's like exactly every game is an is a mixture of ideas and mechanics and i'm going to be following this closely because my worry is that if nintendo manages to win this somehow which i don't think they will but if they manage to win it win it somehow i think it sets a really rough precedent for game development to where developers feel like they have to be very careful about borrowing mechanics from other games and iterating on them in interesting ways out of fear that they might end up getting hit in this way so do you have anything that you know that kind of comes up for you regarding this or what do you think is going to happen i i don't know i the biggest thing that i took away from watching that trailer was holy shit those are just pokemon oh 100 percent and but I've thought that, to be fair, I've thought that with Temtem. I've thought that with a number no, of other games. No, Temtem, I do not agree about Temtem at all. Oh, I think this game's worse. This game, but, th this is the same design language. Like, sure. Something I'm writing is the same as Pokemon, but there's no design language of the big eyes, all this kind of stuff that is like identifiably Pokemon. Like there's a Jatini in this trailer, and that's the thing. Like I don't necessarily care about that kind of stuff. There's a um, Zangoose in this trailer. Yeah, <laughs> there's a fucking. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, so I don't know. I don't because in my in my head, I disagree with you, but I can't okay. necessarily. So you, hold on. Now, just I, to clarify, you're saying you disagree about. You think it should be fair for patenting? Game mechanics? Yeah, I don't have... <laughs> I can't articulate why I don't have a problem with it, but I don't have a problem with it. because. <sighs> but I do see... I do see the argument that eventually every mechanic will be patented so then you can't make a game. There is that argument. But I think stuff like specifically the Nemesis system is something that is deeper than just we made bad guy hate you. I think the way that no, those agreed. games work is I, much I do deeper. Agree. And my, as much as I don't love it, back when we had the conversation with Saul, my actual stance was I, knowing what the Nemesis system actually involves, I can understand why they ended up there. I think what's weird is the Nemesis system is is a lot more involved in terms of how it actually backends functions and how there's a whole AI system tied into this mm -hmm. and how it communicates with a bunch of things. And what they patented is that exact process yeah. so that they could license it out to people. And again, my worries are still the same, but I think it's a little more reasonable than you throw a device, it catches something, it adds to your inventory. Well, and and that's that's kind of my concern here is that it feels too vague to have been something to patent. 
Um, well, the problem to me with this is so. The problem to me with this patent is that they patent they pat like this is an annoying sentence to say. I apologize. They patented it after Power World came out, specifically the Sue Power World. So, like this doesn't now is that accurate? Yeah, go. You can look it up right now. It's it, it was like last year, this year they patented that stuff. So, I think it was in September, and then the lawsuit came in August. Like I'm, I'm nine hundred percent sure that that's true. So, this I think is a different system. But I guess the argument for me is like, should you be able to patent the inside of an iPhone? I think inherently, yes, you'd be you 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 would say that. Yeah, you can patent the innards of an iPhone. So then, what's the difference with video games? I think it's one of those things where is it because it's I, a creative medium. I would take medium? it a step back, right? I take it a step back, and maybe it is because it's a creative medium. But I, where I'd go is something a little more like for like. So I'd go to movies. Mm-hmm. Do you think? I, I don't even know if you know what a Dutch angle is, but I assume I know what a Dutch angle because it's a very common thing. I it do, would yeah. feel like somebody patenting a Dutch angle or patenting pat, uh, patenting a specific zoom, because and it's like that feels like that's just the way that you interact with the piece of entertainment and a way that you go about portraying it. And so, in a game mechanic, in a lot of ways, it's just the way that you're interacting with the piece of entertainment. And I'm not going to say that there shouldn't be. Uh, Patenting does inherently reward somebody with coming up with a genuinely interesting and new idea. Um, And so I can kind of see that. I think what's kind of weird here is this is made worse if you are correct in that Nintendo just patented this this just so they could do this. This would be a, I'd still not love it, but I'd be, it'd be a little different if Nintendo patented this in 1994. Mm hmm. Which also, the patent would have been up by now and anybody could have done it. Because I don't know if you remember, there was a patent that Bandai Namco did uh, where a lot of the early Dragon Ball games, like Budokai, I don't know if yeah, you remember, there would be on-screen mini games during the load screen. And I always thought mm-hmm. that was cool. And they patented that so no one else could do it. Um, you know, that'd be like uh, Tony Hawk patenting the fact that American Wasteland had, quote, no loading screens because it just put you in a bus and and loaded while it was driving so that you didn't see the load screen you know it's i I don't know i to me it it feels like it would keep a game from tunic like tunic from being able to be around so slight misinformation okay they filed the patents in 2021 but they were only approved in august of this year so i think that's where the people who i got my information from might have gotten confused so yeah um but either way i don't know i hear what you're saying but i feel like it might be because of the examples, but I think it's just been a flimsy argument of why it doesn't work. Again, and I think, like, like, like your wife's comments is a, is in, inherently like sure, because it's inherently it's like oh, patenting the system would make games worse. But you know, I don't know. It's it's the same thing. Like, I could copyright the word warden because I use it in a way in my book, right? Yeah. Or like I said copyright, not patent. So I don't know. I think the the thing is like companies. Well, a patent is like a series of me- of mechanisms towards how you get something right. So I, like when I, you do a patent yeah. for gaming, and I just in case anyone doesn't know the difference, mm-hmm. right? Copyright is for uh, intellectual property, so a a concept, a right. series of ideas pulled together to make a property, and that is what you you're copywriting that. A trademark is for a name. Mm-hmm. and like a branding situation. And then a patent is for the way in which you have discovered to meet a design want in a very specific way. So like Sony had a patent for being able to take a controller and split it in half. They didn't end up doing anything with it, but they wanted the patent the way that they had discovered that so that if anybody else does it, they can make some of the money or stop it from happening outright if they wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Um and so 
I think all that's there. And if you go into this, clearly the patent would be catching a Pokemon. So the patent would probably be something like the person has a sphere. They hit the ball on the sphere. They throw the sphere. It rocks, gives you a chance of success. If it's successful, it pulls it back into you. And it's probably something like that. And it's probably illustrated very similar to that. Um, so, look, I, I'm, I'm not even saying you're wrong, but I guess what I'll go through here is that y- – it's not even that I'm saying it shouldn't happen, but I'm saying we as gamers and people who pull into and enjoy the entertainment that comes from it should hope that this is not something that is given precedent in this way because I feel the exact same way, just to give a final example for me, when people like Tom Petty just would try and copyright a chord progression and how many songs they've ended up getting rights on because it happens to have the same three chords as one part of one of their songs. And I think that that is ridiculous. That one of the best things about music is hearing an idea and riffing off of it and doing something similar. But also, there's only so many chords. You are eventually going to use the same chord progression. And I always love the, for anybody who looked into it, Ed Sheeran, uh, during this thing, took a guitar into the courtroom and played a bunch of car, a bunch of songs that use the same four chord progression to prove how many songs use the same thing and how if you chose to do this, that you would inherently limit all of these songs to being owned by whoever you decided to let have this copyright and how it is in many ways limiting creative freedom and allowing people to come up with interesting ideas in music that you don't even always hear a similarity, even though actually it is there so let it go with that but i i hope that this is not something that is uh that nintendo wins and it gives other people precedent to start trying to smack down uh definitely for indie developers i think this is going to hit them hard because any big developer who has the money to worry about patenting and the time to deal with the process can do so and then suddenly patent something that they didn't even come up with (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then push it down on games uh, that are that are using it uh, that for people that can't afford that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, all right, moving on. Uh, Alan Wake Two has its first expansion with the Lake House coming in October, uh, and it's pulling in the Federal Bureau of Control once more, which already took a big step into Alan Wake Two story. Uh, so, it is. Uh, As far as it says, the second of two announced DLC expansions will send players to a mysterious facility situated on the shores of Cauldron Lake from the original game. Um, So you have that. Uh, The Last of Us Part 1 is joining PS Plus as part of The Last of Us Day, which honestly checks out. I think this is a reasonable move, and it is only for people with extra and premium tier. And then we get into a slightly more interesting uh, remaster situation than what we saw with Horizon, and that is the Legacy of Cain Soul Reaver 1 and 2 remastered collection, which was leaked ahead of this. I am, am trying to figure out if I want to play these games again because I have such a love for them in my mind. And looking at it, I'm like, this looks great. <laughs> but but. I don't know, kind of like you're talking about with Time Splitters. These are ultimately PS1, PS2 games. Um, do I, I really... Yeah, I mean, again, last time I did play them, they were great. So getting a new fresh coat of paint on them, I think I'm down. Let me uh, clarify. I played them last week, and they're fine. Oh, sweet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you play the PC versions, or did you play the original PS1? Dreamcast. Dreamcast, the best version. Yep. Yeah, okay. Big Dreamcast right. boy. I will say though that the only work the only version of Sonic Adventure 2 that saves on my Steam Deck is the GameCube version. So I'm playing Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Ah. Oh, you playing the worst one. Dude, I gotta say, I, I know we're not in the what we're playing section anymore, but that game is so funny because you you know the Chow Garden is like what I'm there for, and I'm like I want an evil Chow, and I'm just throwing it in the water and letting Beating it drown, the shit out of and it. then picking it up and throwing it across the fucking garden. I'm like, this is so <laughs> fucked up, and it's hilarious. I love this game. That game across the board is so funny to me because it takes itself so seriously while putting those characters in the weirdest situations. Sonic just jumping on top of the president's limousine and talking to the president in the story mode is wild. Yeah, but I so love good. it also. So it's like, oh, I've escaped this helicopter. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's cool. I, I love Raziel. I use that name uh, all the time in RPGs. It's one of my most common names. I actually think... No, I, I chose a different name. I, I, I came up with my own name for my uh, my paladin in um, Baldur's Gate 3. But I almost <laughs> named him Raziel because it's one of my most common go-to names. It's a good name. Um, Stellar Blade is getting a uh, <laughs> is getting DLC in the most obvious way possible. It is a near automata collaboration. Now they did not go into too much detail about what exactly it is. There's of course photo mode and all these other things that are coming along, and then they just kind of tease the near automata stuff by letting you dress Eve up as uh, a two or rather two uh, B rather, and. Um, I don't know. First of all, I love it because it's so obvious and on the nose. The game was very inspired by Nier. Mm. Uh, but I'm curious to see if they'll go deeper and have some kind of weird story integration. That'd be cool. But I did to make it woke because they put a woman in it. It's got a <laughs> DEI chin. I don't know about that, man. Uh, she's tell, not even uh, a woman. She's a she's a robot. She's oh, an android. That's why it's not woke. Because <laughs> it's not a real woman. Yeah. Uh, can you tell everyone what message I sent you as this trailer was playing, by the way? <laughs> oh. Wait, as this trailer was playing? Yeah. Once Uh-oh, I saw I this just... trailer, I sent you a I sent you a gif immediately. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that that's what this was in in reference to, but it's the uh, Billy Crystal saying tissue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I was like, nice. oh, I could hear the boner from here. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm kind of bummed because that's actually a game. I got way more into dressing Eve up than I thought I would. And I would have loved photo mode to be in that game. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one <laughs> of those things I where I feel like, I don't know if you know, I'm sure you know the game because I've showed it out a couple of state of plays. But like, I feel like Infinity Nikki is going to be a game mm. that I make fun of. And then it drops on plus. So I'm like, I'll try it. And then it's like a hundred hours of my life is just dressing up. Dressing Infinity up girls Nikki looks pretty cool too. So I, it I'm does. With you. I it think looks it, great. Yeah. But it's yeah, clearly I'm, I'm not for me, and it's gonna become my life for like a month. <laughs> it's like it's gonna be a, well, the new game I wail on. Chris, I have the most surprising thing here, and I don't know why this is so surprising to me, but it really is. The Lunar Remastered Collection. We're going back to older games remastered that are just really interesting to see. Lunar Silver Star Story Complete and Lunar 2 Eternal Blue Complete are very niche, very beloved JRPG games, uh, and they are coming to PlayStation with enhanced graphics, audio, and quality of life improvements. I am curious to see if, if these uh get the reception that Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters got, or if this is going to be more in the vein of some of the earlier remasters of some of the early play of some of the early Final Fantasy games that people hated. <laughs> so this will be curious to see how people end up loving it, but it's cool to see such a wild game come back around. Um, but clearly at a, at a price. I noticed that they did not do this as a PS one game. You can play on PS five. This is a remaster. So, yeah, I don't know. This was one that made me laugh because it was just like came minutes before I knew that we were seeing another remaster that people were not going to be happy with. Sure. And it's like, yeah, let's let's pick a lane here, guys. No remasters or or or, or any remaster. I don't know. Like, yeah, what's, that was what cool, but I don't have a lot to say about it. So, yeah, I don't I don't have much. It looks fine. Yeah, Shredder's Revenge is getting some additions. We've already talked about Metro Awakening. Now, the Fantasian Neo Dimension, uh, which is the Apple Arcade game that came out, um, is now going to make its way over to PS4 and PS5 on December 5th. And it is from um, Nobuo uh, Umatsu, which is Final Fantasy veteran. And uh, what is the other guy? Hironobu Sakaguchi or whatever, um, which is cool. And uh, I, I don't know how I feel about it, but it's very much, if you look at it, it looks like a classic RPG. So if you've been playing the Pixel Collection and you've been enjoying those, this might be yet another game to kind of throw on your list of something to give you that kind of vibe. Uh, and it's cool to see it finally leave its uh, its Apple Arcade uh, prison. <laughs> Not that it has to be a, a terrible thing, but it's just there. Um, and then I thought it was cool how after a lot of these style of games, they kind of highlighted the fear the spotlight, which is that 
PlayStation, uh, like original PS1 inspired horror game that PC has been getting a lot of. Uh, and this is one of the games from Blumhouse Games. So this is, uh, we saw that earlier, or I guess technically late last year, if I remember correctly, or was that a, no, that was at Summer Games Fest, uh, if I'm not mistaken. You're right. It was at the last Summer Games Fest. Yeah, I it was so this is for some one of the first games we're seeing from them, and it does look interesting. Doesn't mean it'll be great, but it's coming to PS5 and PC uh, side. Um, Chris, I'm a yeah. little curious to see where you are in here because I didn't. I've never seen the original games, which is Arcade and Arcade Unchained, uh, but it's an online RPG, Arcade Chronicles. It's it reminds me of Black Desert in the way that they market it as though it is not an MMO and they make you believe that it's going to be kind of more of a normal RPG and then you start playing it and it's just a fucking MMO. And that's exactly <laughs> what Black Desert did. Black Desert looked really cool. They hide all the UI when they show gameplay to make it look all super streamlined and then you play and you're like, no, this, this is still an MMO. It's got cool combat, but it's an MMO at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, uh, it's why I'm really wary of that game. I think it's Crimson Desert because it looks yep. incredible. And it's made by the people who made Black Desert. And it's in that world. So I'm like, but I don't also trust not you. not supposed to be online. But I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since I've seen that game. Uh, I don't know what's going on with it. But it says it's still releasing in the second half of, uh, of 2025. Open world single player action adventure game. Mm. I don't believe them. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but, but I can't blame you for where you're at on that. So, uh, But I, it was the entire time I was like, this looks kind of cool. And it also does that thing where it's showing like story beats of characters reacting to things. And I'm like, is it going to be story? And then it was like, you have to be online. And I was like, they're fucking me. I can see it right now. <laughs> they're, they're, they're trying to get me. Yeah, but they're not going to. And then at first I thought it was Black Desert. I was like, is this a new Black Desert expansion? And they're getting me all over again. But they didn't. All right, so Chris, this right. is a game that I think you're going to have more to say about than me, but I am also I'm very curious. You're a big self-proclaimed Bioware lover. We've talked about how Bioware is not the same Bioware as what you loved, but all the same, Dragon Age of the Veil Guard got shown in pretty damn, you know, that was a, a nice chunk of gameplay and, and a pretty big thing showing combat kind of come together. We've seen some of these things because of the previous gameplay thing, but this is seeing it a little more boisterous and a little more seeing the control, the combos you can do between your people. How are you feeling about Dragon Age as a Bioware fan? And do you even, you've always struck me as you're more Mass Effect than you are Bio, uh, than you are Dragon Age. That's correct. Um, I think... I think this looks really good and I don't understand why the art style is the way the art style is. Like the Kunari look fucking awful. Those are the the ones with horns. Mm. It's, em- it's embarrassing how bad they look. And I'm not talking about like the you know the character creator, but even in the trailer they were showing, it looks like they took a model of a person's face and then s- stuck the forehead out and put horns on it. Yeah. And it looks terrible. And if you look them up in Dragon Age 2, in Inquisition, in Dragon Age Origins, they look cool. Yeah, the the that's who I was in my Inquisition run. Yeah. Which I didn't play neat. all that game, but that's what I had and I thought it was a cool design. Right. And now they look terrible and that's what I don't get is why you change this. But outside of that, everything else looks great. I don't give a fuck about the top surgery scars you can put on your character. I don't give a shit about any of that because I'm going to make a white man with a sword. I don't care. Actually, actually, if I'm being honest with myself, I'm going to make a white woman with a sword. So it doesn't matter. But I don't... What I'm concerned about is why the Kunar... Everything else will probably be good because it looks fun. That whole sequence looked awesome. So I will not be buying this day one. But I will play it. I will still be, you know, 20 hours into an 120 hour RPG. So I will not be playing Dragon Age Origins or Veilguard. But eventually I will give it a shot. So that's exactly where I'm at. My immediate thought was I don't think the game looks bad. 
I think the game looks well presented. It's got nice image quality. I do not care for the art style particularly. I don't. A lot of games have been doing this, and it's unfortunate. This looks like if you just made a more realistic version of the way they chose to do Prince of Persia earlier this year, where it's like everything's got this purple to it, and it's all trying to pull in these more rounded and a little more stylistic, which is, I actually think, great. The upside to a game like this is that this game is going to age incredibly well because they did not choose to go hyper real. They chose to go stylized real. And so you see a lot of detail and wrinkle and the performances and the face. And I was like, this looks really good, but also they're not trying to look real. So that was cool. But I thought the dragon looked kind of dumb. I didn't really love the, the way they chose to design it and put the colors into it. But I was interested to see that, considering that a lot of people hated Dragon Age 2, the combat in this looks a lot more Dragon Age 2 than it does Dragon Age Origins or Inquisition. Uh, And that's actually a boon for me, because I think Dragon Age 2 is a much more fun game to play, uh, Mm -hmm. despite not necessarily being quite as good in the story and and RPG departments as uh, Origins was. I can't talk too much about Inquisition. I I could not get into Inquisition. I like Dragon Age Origins. Um, I've been playing through that. That was actually my plan while I was waiting for the PS5 Pro was to play Origins again and finally finish that Platinum. But um, yeah, Origins is a weird game because it's, it's very MMO in a way where it's like you press X and your character keeps swinging. It's not like a dynamic combat thing. Um, and it looks like they're doing that a little bit here, uh, which is fine. Um, but yeah, I, I, to me, this is one of those games where I'm like, this looks really good. You're showing it, but there's a lot of things that I do not like about this game, the way this game looks. Yeah. I think that's the biggest issue. And I wonder if any of that will change. Yeah, I doubt it. I mean, considering where it's at, it's just, I think for me, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I will try this, but it's not anywhere near how my radar. And I'll probably, if I'm being real to myself, I'll most likely only try it once you buy it. It's funny because what I was about to say was I feel like both of us are going to be playing chicken on who's going to buy it. Who's going to buy it first? <laughs> if it hits a low enough price point or if uh, if I'm getting to December 30th or whatever and I don't have all my PlayStation points spent, I may just throw you know $70 at it. <laughs> we'll yeah. see. It is an EA game. There's a decent chance it's going to be discounted pretty quickly, but we'll just have to wait and see. Crazy enough, I've been trying to get Dragon Age Inquisition on PS5 on sale i'm not paying 40 dollars for it it's i've never seen a drop price i have it wishlisted i get notifications cheapest i can get it is 35.99 because i have ea access which i need to get interesting but yeah interesting um all right there's towers of agazba which i it's it's an action adventure builder game it's like a little fantasy game um it looks okay. It does. It didn't necessarily strike me as a game to uh, for me, but it hits. That's the game that is uh, early access in November, showing that Sony is far more likely and more willing to do that. Um, and then the really the last thing to talk about here uh, until we get to the the real big reveal was what we talked about earlier in that. Uh, Finally, they're releasing custom plates for the Slim, and by proxy of the fact that they are the slim, the same plates for the Pro, they are doing custom uh, our new colored plates and new colored dual senses. Um, and I'm quite a fan of the teal, and I didn't think I would be. But as it was coming on screen, my wife and I were both like, okay, that's looking pretty good. So my fallback plan is that if uh, – if I can't get the PS5 Pro with the 20th anniversary edition, I'll just buy the teal and yeah. be fine. <laughs> Move yep. on about my life. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I think that's a good thing to see. But uh, I'm curious how they'll be priced as well. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're going to hold that same kind of 40 to 50 dollars. 49.99. Price yeah, that's not too surprising. So, uh, it looks like the the teal uh, is unfortunately coming later. That's January 23rd, so it'll be something a little down the line. But the uh, the Chroma Pearl and the Chroma Indigo uh, are coming out on November 7th. And you can at least pre-order all of them on October, October 3rd, but you just won't get the teal stuff until 23rd Dude, of January. I just want the GameCube Purple one again. I'm mad I never was able to get that. And then now yeah. they won't work on the Pro, so I need the PS5 Pro GameCube Purple case. This is one of those rough things where everybody who bought the Spider-Man 2 plates. Mm-hmm. I hope you're smart and put that shit away because it's 
wasted money now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. So we got to see uh, what I kind of expected, though it still didn't do, I think, a great job of showing it. Uh, they did end up doing a big section dedicated to showing off the PS4 Pro and the games that are going to benefit from it, including some upcoming games. Though I thought it was interesting the little montage of games they had thrown together did not include Silent Hill 2. Mm. I didn't notice that. And I that. think it might be that Silent Hill 2 releases before the Pro. And so it may not be required to have Pro enhancements. <laughs> But I don't know for sure. Uh, so with that in mind, they showed off uh, a, a bunch of stuff for Stellar Blade getting improvements. They saw they showed uh, Gran Turismo 7. A lot of the games we already saw, uh, as well as the F1 game. But we also saw Metal Gear Solid 3 Delta, which I thought was interesting to kind of see getting hit on there. Uh, and before that, Mark Sony said that there's going to be... We're showing new, uh, games as well as some we've never announced before. And it implied there was going to be more than one. And then they just <laughs> unveil one new game from Sony Studios. I thought the same thing. Yeah. We're excited but, to show you games that are running on PS5 Pro. One game. Which, yeah, cool, but still. Yeah. And look, that's fine. And this is where we're going to get into a, a fun conversation, in my opinion. Because I think what they're doing with the Ghost franchise is very sensible. I think this is the right call. I don't think there was any way to follow up Ghost of Tsushima in a way that was going to make all the players happy. And when you do games that have choices and you follow it up with a sequel, it makes it really difficult for have to have people feel like they enjoyed it. Because you may have to choose a choice that they did not make to make the story work in the sequel. But that makes people who chose the opposite way feel disenfranchised coming into this game. And so I think Ghost of Yote, or however you pronounce that, I'll go ahead and throw that out there. I do not know. But this is what I always thought Naughty Dog would do with The Last of Us. I, From the moment I rolled credits on The Last of Us 1, I was like, if we ever get another Last of Us game, it'll be two new characters set in this world and they may reference Joel and Ellie as an Easter egg, but it'll just be different people because then you don't have to worry about ruining this ending. <laughs> and uh, that's not at all what happened. And I still love The Last of Us Part Two, but clearly it was controversial. I really wonder if this game ever had a, a, a section or a time in development where they were looking at bringing forward Jen Sakai and they decided against it or from the ground, you know, they were like, we're not going to use it again. It's going to be a new story, new area. We can't do Tsushima again. So we're going to go into a, a different area. Um, I think this looks great. Looks really cool. Carries a lot of the same charm that the first one had. I wish we had have gotten to see uh, a little bit more than what we actually did. Uh, Cause it wasn't really gameplay in the way that I would consider. Um, it was more just like a, uh, I think, but it, it did show that it's coming in 2025. So, Chris, I'll uh, kind of relay this over to you. What did you think about this uh, show off? And then also, what do you think about it being a ghost of being the franchise rather than ghost of Tsushima being the franchise? Well, I think that makes perfect sense because how do you have another ghost of Tsushima? I mean, that literally, not in terms of how do you have another game called that? Um, yeah. I downloaded Ghost of Tsushima again. I'm going to give it another shot. I don't. I, I didn't finish Ghost. I was. I didn't stick with it. Um, you know. So this was one of those. I'm glad we finally heard something from first party more than I'm super excited about what we heard from first party. Um, but you know, who knows? I, I really do want to give Ghost of Tsushima a shot because I've had this theory that outside of one franchise. Um, that kind of doing this show and being a very uh very tuned into the industry is giving me giving me giving me a maybe not a complex but like i tend to look like oh shit the new playstation game it's going to be something fucking revolutionary and then i fall off of them because they're just games they are <laughs> you know well and, and like we had that uncomfortable period where I, I, I liked Forbidden West. I think it's a good game. Mm -hmm. I liked Ragnarok. I think it's a good game. 
but I think both Forbidden West and Ragnarok are worse games and ba- and not good enough follow ups to 2018 God of War and 2017 Horizon. Uh, and that was a weird position to be in because I did really enjoy the game, and they are some of my favorite experiences on PS5. Unfortunately, we're getting those a lot less frequently than when we were on PS4. But all that to say. I understand why these things can get kind of rough. There are clear issues that I have with both Horizon Forbidden West and God of War Ragnarok Mm -hmm. that feel sloppy in comparison to their predecessors. Uh, And so, I don't know. I'm kind of glad that that doesn't... they By doing this, it's like a clean slate. They're able to take some of the ideas and move forward with them, but they can completely reiterate where they want to because it's a different protagonist with different movement sets and a different backstory, therefore different expectations. The thing about Forbidden West that's weird is it's kind of crazy to play a game where I'm playing as the same character and yet I can do less than I could in the game before in the case of Horizon. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, and yeah, you can do more in some areas, but why did you restrict anything if I'm the same person? That always feels weird. Uh, God of War Ragnarok's problems are not gameplay bound for me. I actually think it's a great game from a gameplay standpoint. A lot of it comes down to um, story decisions. <laughs> mm. uh, so, yeah, I'm glad to see this kind of absolving itself from that worry. It gets yeah. to be its own thing again. Yeah, and I, I'm sure it'll be. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a good game. I don't know. I just. Um, I, it's one of those things where, like, yeah, I do. I'm on a PlayStation podcast, but I'm a video game player who plays on PlayStation. I'm not a fucking PlayStation first, you know, guy. And that's yeah. just one of those things where it's like, you know, I, I, they're they're just games. <laughs> it's not. It's not a bad thing, you know. Spider Man well, Two is and- like it's. So you know, if you talk to PlayStation fanboys, it's the it's the second coming of Jesus Christ, and the reality is like a lot of that game is actually kind of bad, but a lot of it's really fucking good. So it's like, you know, yeah, given the take. But then you get Concord, and I actually like fucking Concord. So who the fuck knows? Video games are fucking weird. I don't think video games and are weird. the people who like them are so varied. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what makes it complicated. But you know, it's funny you talked about that because you're right. You do kind of get this weird sense, and I I got over that pretty quickly. You're coming into it, so you've had to kind of go through that process. Where I've been I've been doing the show for so long that I've already gone through that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm with you, and you know, one of the things that was interesting is I know that there's almost no way around it because we are a PlayStation podcast. We have that name, and we primarily play on there. But Donovan was saying that you know, like he he knows that this isn't the case, but he's like he's like hearing y'all's arguments about the PS5 Pro did sound a little more Sony pony than y'all usually do. And I was like, yeah, I knew that that was going to be a possibility because we weren't shitting on it. But the reality is, is I, I <laughs> my response to that was if. If instead of a PS5 Pro being announced, Microsoft came out and said, here's the Xbox Series Y, and it's $700, my response would have been identical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why I was like, so it's, it's it's not a Sony pony thing, even though I know that the the optics of it does feel like if you don't know anything about us and you hop in and you hear this... It probably sounds like we're just, you know, riding Sony's dick, as people like to say. But the reality is, no, Sony does plenty of things that I think are dumb. I just don't think the PS5 Pro is one of them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. So it, it's interesting to see. But uh, go ahead. We're, we're nuanced men. It yeah, well, back. you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm actually... As weird as it was, and, and talking about the other things, I wish that they would, re, uh, you know, kind of remaster ahead of that. Uh, for ten dollars, I'm actually super interested. Now that I've said what I just said about Forbidden West and the original, that's a game I am interested to replay and see if I still think Zero Dawn is better than Forbidden West now. I'd be curious, yeah. because really the only thing changing is that they're getting it visually in line. I, if they change the mechanics to where they limit all the things that they limited in Forbidden West, that'll be where I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah. They might, though, because it's like you said, right? It's like Dead Space changed some of the mechanics for Dead Space and Resident Evil 4 changed some of the mechanics for Resident Evil. So it's possible. <sighs> well, maybe I can get up there if I just jump on this ledge. <laughs> well, maybe we can move on to this next topic if Brett just pulls up the next piece of news. 
<laughs> well, Chris, unfortunately for you, there is no next piece of news. Uh, that rounds oh. it out. And uh, we started late today, so... There was no uh, more news. I got to go to bed. <laughs> I got to go to bed. <laughs> Look at that. You knew it. Uh, I got work in the morning, unfortunately. And uh, I got to sleep well tonight so that I can sleep well tomorrow so that Thursday I can have the magical luck to hopefully get that 20th anniversary bundle. Yeah. yeah. Heart, of the, heart of the credit cards. <laughs> I'm really curious uh, how they're going to end up doing it because seeing people already doing the eBay listings for ten thousand dollars for an attempt to buy you one, I, I got to be, dude. I got to be straight up. I want to say this to anyone in our audience, and I feel like Brett would agree with me. If you pay someone ten thousand dollars to attempt to buy you a PS5 Pro, you do not deserve your ten thousand dollars, and I'm glad you lost it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad we're well, on the same well, like, I, I don't know if I. I guess I wouldn't say that so much as. For people who are like, what the fuck? I'm like, dude, if you, if it, that's a listing, all it is is someone saying, if you are willing to pay me this, I'm willing to do this. Whoever yeah. pays that person $10,000, if even one person does it, first of all, good for them. But yeah, <laughs> they probably, yeah. And you know what? I'll even go as far as to say, I hope they do get it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope but more they importantly, <laughs> more importantly, People are like, what the fuck? And I'm like, yeah, dude, if people have got that much money, you're not going to do anything about it anyway. These are people that don't give a shit. The $10,000 is a piss in the wind if they're going to spend it on eBay for an attempt at something. But dude, the thing the thing for me, which is the reason why I would not respect a single person who does that and I would actively make fun of them, it's going to cost you probably five times less to just buy it on eBay. <laughs> yeah. Whenever so, it actually, yeah. If you, so if you pay ten thousand dollars, you deserve to lose it, and I hope you do not get your console. <laughs> you know what? That's fair enough. I, I'll, I'll move a little bit over to that side. <laughs> I appreciate you joining me on the dark side. Yeah, uh, I am curious to see how they end up doing this, and they haven't talked about it yet. I'm hoping they do the same thing that they did for PS5s when COVID was having scalpers come for them. I hope that you have to have PS Plus in order to be able to buy this. Uh, I hope that whenever you hop in, it's a lottery, and that doesn't matter when you got into the queue. Once you hit the queue, it gives you a lottery spot of where you're going to be, and it's still first come, first serve. So you could have been the last person to join, and the lottery gives you the first slot. That would be I think that that does a lot to balance it and fair it up because you know you don't want a bunch of bots hopping in and immediately being able to buy them just because somebody was able to flood the queue with you know, 10,000 bots the first minute. <laughs> so <laughs> true. Yeah. I'm hoping all of that's in play so that they minimize how many um, scalpers and crap get this because there's nothing worse than having a really cool anniversary item like this just get completely skewered by scalpers. And that happened with the 20th anniversary when pretty bad. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the take where people are like, Oh, Sony's not making this for fans. They're making it for scalpers. Stupid. Okay. I'm glad Clearly they're not. Face, they're so. not making any more money off of the scalpers. Why would they make it for the scalper? You, the fan, are going to pay them the same amount of money that the scalper is going to get. They're not getting get that excess money to scalp. The scalper is not like, hey, Sony, hook me up and I'll give you 20% of my sale. <laughs> That's not happening. I'm assuming that the argument is like they're releasing a limited amount and the only people who are going to get in and get it are scalpers. But if you're correct and it's a lottery, then like it's anybody. Yeah, you know. some scalpers are going to get them, and I, the thing is, is some scalpers are people that are PlayStation fans and who would want it. But much like you and your four hundred dollar vinyl, they just want to get it so they can make a buck. <laughs> that's all it is. They well, they, they like I want it, but I also want the the extra thousand dollars I can get for selling it for two thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like I wouldn't consider myself if I got this. Like I wouldn't open it, but I also wouldn't immediately sell it. So it's one of those things. Like, am I a scalper? Maybe, or I'm just an idiot with money. I don't know which one that is, but <laughs> it's the latter. Yeah, you're right. You have money. You would look at the box and be like, "That's cool," and then yeah. eventually you'd be like, "It's not as cool as the the." value that it would have if I were to sell it. Therefore, right. now I will yeah, sell but, it. But that's the thing. Like Even my Persona vinyl, like it's on my wall and I'll never get rid of it. I just will never yeah. listen to it. On the off chance, you know, when I set up the elaborate Uncharted style uh, will that I plan on leaving for my children, the end result will be a $400 Persona 5 vinyl. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Like I've always had this dream of having enough money that my will is one of these like coming of age movie stories of how these 
brothers and sisters got closer when their dad died, and he sent them on an adventure. But I hope the the ending of that should be a 30th anniversary PS5 Pro and a Persona 5 Final, and that's it. There's no money. I was broke as fuck. But here's like maybe all my money went towards bucks. paying for this adventure. For you guys. <laughs> exactly. A lot of non-refundable. <laughs> the inheritance was Deposit. the friends we made along the way. <laughs> yeah. Guys, all my money went towards this, so I hope that my inheritance is that you came closer as a family. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not a terrible option. I, I but, love that. All right, Chris. Uh, well, is there anything else you want to throw out there before we wrap this baby up? No, I'm good, man. All right. As a thank you to our patrons who went over to patreon.com slash nartech and gave as little as a dollar per month to support this show, we always shout them out at the end of the episode uh, just as a little way to... Uh, show appreciation for what they allow us to do here. So without further ado, we will be back in two weeks, hopefully with some new crazy topic that comes about. Uh, maybe, maybe I will have had a, a 30th anniversary PlayStation to brag about a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but until that time, we'd like to thank the overlord, Spencer, Brandon Edwards, Alex, Barry Rogers, Stingray X, Matt Tubbs, Easton328, Leechion69, Bailey Robertson, Mark Schutz, Rude Days93, Kevin Bacon Bits, Danny Villiobos, Jehuti MD, No Fate, Josh Ayers, Derek Porter, Matthew Green, and Sean Santarude. Thanks to each and every one of you. See you next time.